Hey guys, welcome back. Oh yeah, it's Matt Chat episode 488. Yes, uh, featuring a very special interview uh, with a guy named Happy Keller. Now you may have heard that name if you're a fan of the uh, Electronic Arts sports games of the really uh, early 90s on through uh, the Madden series, the uh, Walsh, uh, the games with Bill Walsh, the games with uh, Earl Weaver, uh, the uh, skier on the skater die, the skier die, uh, PGA uh, golf, just a ton of uh, sports related titles as well as much, much more. Now in this interview, he gives us a lot of great behind the scenes uh, stories about those games, but much more. And he's got a lot to say just about the industry in general, uh, game development. I just think you're really, really going to uh, enjoy this interview. It's very deep and meaningful material, if I do say so myself. Of course, all credit to Happy for that. I also want to do a special shout out here to Sue Manley, uh, who I interviewed before for this show, but just a good friend and supporter of the show as well. She helped me set up, contact uh, Happy and get him on the show. So definitely want to say a special uh, thank you to Sue. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Happy Keller. All right, folks, I am here with Happy Keller or Coach Keller. He is a, a video game designer veteran he's headed divisions he's produced things he's designed things he's done it all i suppose at some point probably i don't know i was looking at this fairly extensive uh list of credits that you've got here happy it's very <laughs> very impressive i don't even know like there, there's so many standout titles here probably madden nfl 94 mm -hmm. i don't know which one of you that, that was the that was the very first uh Madden football game to uh, sell a million units. Wow. And uh, in fact, we had a, uh, a celebratory, a shipping day celebratory party that uh, Mr. Madden, you know, John attended uh, where he brought in his, uh, his, uh, his favorite barbecue uh, ribs and chicken and stuff to celebrate with us. And it was a, it was a warehouse that the company had rented that all that was in it was uh, a million copies of John Madden football for the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. And that was all that was there. And, and uh, it was uh, awe-inspiring and, and one of the scarier moments in my life because the thought that keeps coming back to your head back in those days was, what if these cartridges don't sell through? What if they come back? Because <laughs> uh, the uh, product cost uh, back then was uh, much more significant than it is these days. Yeah, well, let's see. You know, I've always heard, I did a little bit of research on those games when I was doing the, my vintage games book. I don't know if you ever got a chance to look at that, but, you know, just the the importance of that John Madden series and the impact that it's had, you know, not just, I would argue, not just on that, the genre uh, that it was part of, but just the whole industry. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things I, I read a lot about was how Madden took so much of an active role, you know, in the oh, game. Oh, he really did. He wasn't he really just a did. passive, you know, sign the papers kind of guy. No, he, he didn't just sign the papers. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, way back when, I mean, the very first version of the game was supposed to be on the Apple II, if you can believe that. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, the and, Apple II is not the game, not the, con not the computer that springs to mind when we think about this series. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. And uh, 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 Trip Hawkins originally signed John, and uh, they... Uh, they got on a train with him to go to a football game and they sat in the train and they had one big long design session on that whole train ride while he was going to his next NFL game. And um, uh, the very first versions of the game they tried to show him was uh, seven on seven because they were the computing power of the uh, Apple II, the feeling was that they couldn't get all 11 of versus 11 on there and uh john uh, according to trip uh, john got uh, beyond upset at 
upon seeing this because he says, oh, seven on seven, seven on seven isn't football. 11 versus 11 is football. I don't know what this is. So uh, it was back to the drawing board, and they and uh, it took several more years before that came out. And, and in fact, the uh, the very first Sega Genesis version uh, that uh, Jim Simmons and Scott Orr uh, uh, designed and worked on, produced by the uh, wonderful great great uh, Richard Hilleman, um, was the very first version of Madden Football that ever came out. Uh, the the Apple II version actually trailed that. <laughs> it took so long to uh, get that to in a state where uh, it could be out there. Mm -hmm. I just remember that series. One of the things I remember about it was, you know, I have, I've always had friends, of course, that like video games, just sort of gamers. Uh, right, that right. was a series that, you know, I go to some some friends of mine that would, would never consider themselves a gamer. <laughs> like they just thought all that was for nerds you know but they would have a sega genesis and they'd be playing this you know this madden series extensively <laughs> you know it really yeah. seemed to cross the threshold somehow and the, you know i guess it's appeal well the the gaming hook uh that was designed for it especially on the video game versions uh was quite good from the very first uh prototypes that were brought in uh of the genesis version i mean it was just there as far as the game the gameplay goes uh the uh, computer versions were much deeper i mean they had play editors way way back in the day when you wouldn't have thought of such a thing and uh, uh to be in a football game uh but uh the genesis version i mean had uh uh, John's playbook in it, plus some other plays that we researched and, and, and put in there, and uh, uh, it was a it was a, quite a time. In, in fact, the uh, well, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna talk out of school. I guess the I, they can come sue me now if they want to. I don't know if you know this there or not, but the, but the very first version of Joe Montana football that Sega published was actually a reskin version of Madden. Mm -hmm. So we, Electronic Arts, in a way, truly owned football on the Sega Genesis there for the, that, uh, the first year and a half, two years of, uh, of football. And yeah, that was probably the biggest, would you say the Genesis version was when it really sort of got exploded out? And Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was kind of, yeah. I guess, around the various forums before that. But that's the one that always comes to my mind. Well, why don't we take it back a little bit? Because, you know, Susan Manley, a good friend of mine, yeah. friend of the show, I guess you, you two have known each other for quite a while. She wanted me to make sure to ask you about how she uh, helped you get into this. Well, I, I, I mean, why? Sue and I go all the way back to when I was a customer at uh, her video game store, uh, well, yeah, video game store, the Video Adventure uh, in San Jose, California, in a now defunct uh, uh, shopping center called the Town and Country Shopping Center. It was right next to a movie theater. And uh, I, I was just an annoying customer, and oh, she figured out that I knew, I knew my crud, and uh, uh, she hired me. And uh, I worked there and uh, we sold video games and uh, computer software there for a few years until it went belly up. And uh, after that, uh, our paths crossed again uh, when uh, I uh, got a job being an a, a assistant manager at, uh, at uh, Bullwinkles, which was, uh, uh, we used to call it, it was a Chuck E. Cheese's except that they serve food. And um, uh, Sue actually came and, and uh, worked there with me there for a while until I, uh, I unfortunately uh, got hit by a car while I was riding my bicycle. And that took me out of action for a year. And honestly, this is what led me to uh, being able to, my, the beginning of my career in electronic arts if you can believe that, because uh, Electronic Arts um, distributed Origin Systems games back in the back in the day, and uh, I had ordered 
Ultima Four for the uh, Commodore for the Commodore sixty four, and uh, I had been promised it was coming. It was coming, and it didn't come for months. And um, when it finally came, I looked at the invoice, and the invoice said that it had shipped two days earlier. And this totally ticked me off. So I didn't call the mail order number that I had. I called Electronic Arts Corporate. <laughs> and I wanted to talk to somebody about my order. And uh, a guy by the name of Dave Cook called me back. And uh, he, he produced, he went on to, he was in marketing at the time and he went on to do some producing of some games as well. And uh, Dave called me back and he told me that, uh, oh, we're really, really sorry. This doesn't, this doesn't uh, reflect electronic arts values. In fact, wow. that's, that was done by an out of house mail order fulfillment company. And we're in the midst of firing them. And I facetiously asked if they were hiring. And he said, yes, as a matter of fact, we are. And uh, I, went up, I went up two days later, interviewed, and got a job inside the uh, fulfillment part, the brand new fulfillment department of Electronic Arts. And that was the beginning of my 12 years at EA. Wait, what, you tell me you called up to complain. Yeah. And somehow that became an impromptu job interview? Yes. <laughs> That's incredible. It is, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I was employee number 53, and, uh, and uh, there are some other things from, from back then. I mean, we were, uh, we were initially hired uh, uh, kind of for a 90-day trial to see if that was going to work out. Uh, uh, Electronic Arts was going to do a buy one, get one free offer on their computer game titles for the Apple and the Commodore and even the Atari 800 way back then. And uh, uh, we needed to sell, ship through X number of units or this, the division that I was just becoming a part of was going to uh, probably be uh, shut down permanently. And uh, fortunately, it ended up being a, a month into that three months, we'd already sold and shipped through enough that it was successful. And uh, then there were some other uh, uh, electronic arts cultural things that came out of that as well. Um, the buy one, get one free program, the uh, customer uh, being customers, they didn't read the instructions very well. So we got a lot of, uh, of uh, requests for a free product that uh, weren't eligible or they purchased free product that wasn't, or they purchased product that wasn't eligible to be used as part of the free, the uh, free promotion. And um, this led to uh, my brother and I, Edward, we wrote a uh, parody song of uh, Money for Nothing called software for nothing and uh we performed it at a uh, what was then famous or infamous um ea friday company meeting and um, this led to the uh, company all the employees in the company writing their own songs and uh uh a very great uh, uh, technical guru, uh, Greg Riker, he produced an album. And in that year of 1986, the employees of Electronic Arts put together their own album of parodies and, and just a good time songs and some serious stuff too. It was, uh, it was a great time, in my opinion, to have been a part of electronic arts. Yeah, I've always heard about how they, you know, especially for the time, you know, that you had these typical games which are shipping in these little Ziploc bags, you know, which wasn't very fancy at all. And I mean, that's part of their whole appeal, their whole shtick, right, was we're treating games as art and we're putting them in fantastic packages. And yes. <laughs> yeah, the old album, the old album cover packaging. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. No, this is the first time I, I didn't know they were actually making real <laughs> albums. So. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. No. It was. Uh, it was. It was great. I mean, I, I'd. Uh, is that floating I around? Sh- I, should, I should send you the song just so you can have a good oh, diggle. Yes. You actually do have the songs. Yeah, I'd love to. Do oh that. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's take a yeah. quick peek, if you will, at this. Uh... I don't know if you can see this. Okay, I tried to pull. It. Can you see the list of? Uh... Oh my God! Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, there's oh, robot uh... rascals. Uh, looking at this one this was i the think the very first the very first thing that i worked on uh i'll, be, I'll bet money it isn't there is was uh was uh, uh deluxe paint 2 oh you for, were deluxe paint deluxe paint 2 for the uh commodore amiga oh and and, we had that i spent many a and half hour playing that it was uh <laughs> it was uh, scary a uh, uh, scary uh, thing to be my prep because I realized I went to my boss, uh, David Grady, and and uh, he said, "What's wrong? What's wrong?" I says, "Well, I realized last night when I was testing this that I could test 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for the rest of my life, and I could never test." all of the features of this product in combination with every other feature of this product. And that just scared the bejesus out of me because it's, it's just like we were responsible for getting this into a form that it could be shipped out there to the public and that it, would, uh, it wouldn't immediately bomb because people uh, uh, were having trouble with it. I'm sorry. I was trying to bring up a picture of Deluxe Paint 2. <laughs> ah, <laughs> Dan Silva, a uh, great, great programmer, nice guy. Oh, I mean, he, he was, uh, yeah, there we go. That was, that, that was actually, that's Deluxe Paint 1. Oh, where's But yeah, but I mean, that's way back in the, uh, way back in the day. Sometimes it can be hard to find these. Well, the whole, this page is dedicated to Deluxe Paint 2. You think they would have the screenshot from... <laughs> well, that might have been that might have been a prototype uh, interface, but uh, Dan worked on it. And he, he altered it a little bit before it shipped. Oh wait, I but, think I've got uh, it now. Let's see this. There you, yeah, that is actually it. Yeah, there you go. Ah! The MS DOS version. MS DOS version by Brent Iverson, another stud programmer. Oh, Brent such a since such a uh, a great programmer just just a really good technical guy just i remember how much fun i had because we had this on our amiga computer i just think about how easy this was and fun even for kids to play with you know and make art yeah oh like, yeah back in the photoshop, day yeah. i don't even know how to make a circle in photoshop yeah yeah but uh, no, I mean, it was, uh, now you have many, many more features, but uh, some could argue that you, it was uh, a lot more accessible back, back then than uh, paint programs are now. Oh, absolutely. I would 100% agree with that. <laughs> you know, something <laughs> like, this, like the MS Paint, you know, it's okay, I guess, whatever they're called. Yeah. It. I mean, Deluxe Paint, though, is so cool. And you even have like the color cycling and stuff you could yeah. put in. Yeah, yeah, I remember when uh, I, I remember when uh, when Dan brought that in, and we were all tripping out on uh, we were all tripping out on that uh, for a couple of days. And you could color cycle even on a brush, and you could paint with the color cycling brush. <coughs> it was quite uh, quite something. Is that the one? Did they bring in Andy Warhol to talk about or to kind of advertise that? Uh, no, but Andy did work on a game uh, with Electronic Arts. Or, or a product called the uh, Mind Mirror. Oh, <laughs> Mind Mirror. Yeah, I think I think that uh, I think that Stuart Bond was the uh, producer of uh, of that product. Uh, st- yeah, I'm pretty sure of that. He he is uh, uh, always always had uh, a lot of uh, esoteric products. So they brought you in to work on Deluxe Paint too. Yeah, that was the very first. That was the very first product I worked on, and, and uh, 
the reason that I was hired out of uh, fulfillment and into uh, be an assistant producer at that time was because I attended an in-house game session with Dan Button, who at oh, that yeah. time work, was working on rope. Well, Dan, Danny, uh, who was at that time working on uh, Robot Rascals. And uh, we'd play for a while and then he'd ask for feedback and changes. And uh, yeah, and uh, he, uh, he came back and he said, well, I can't do that because of this. And I, I, I would come back with, while living within his limitations, I came back with an idea that could work for him. And so he went, oh, that's great. And, and David Grady, who was the producer of that product, he recognized that in me and he went right about to hiring me out of fulfillment and to be an assistant producer because of that gameplay session. So once again, it wasn't exactly an interview, but, but something else turned into a job opportunity. And this time, of course, it was internally within, within EA. And uh, Dan, Dan was so tired of um, the whole reason that that game had uh, everybody at that time was trying to come up with some kind of copy protection that would work. And so because Dan was, he knew that there were a lot more people that were playing Seven Cities of Gold than he ever received royalty checks for. Oh, yeah, the how, could you, how could you possibly prove it? So uh, Robot Rascals included a deck of cards. So you kind of had the card portion of the game was actually copy protection to try to make it harder for people to rip the game off. That, you know, she's so clever. You know, with Mule and... I don't think yeah. I have a Robot Rascals game. Maybe. Oh, Mule to play i mean this goes back to sue you can you can ask sue about times we would be playing mule at the video adventure with four joysticks plugged into an atari 800 i mean yeah i mean it was uh, cutthroat and uh a lot of fun i mean uh dan slash danny was a, a huge influence on uh the way that i would later come to be about trying to uh design a game absolutely just just a, a deep person a wonderful gentle man gentle person well let's see what else we've got <clears throat> so that was one of the early projects yeah oh yeah just fascinating to think how times must have been back in this sort of late 80s period <laughs> uh rampart yeah, it was the that Rampart, Rampart, which was a, a coin op, um, oh, a, a coin op port that we did for uh, the Super Nintendo, and yeah, yeah, I don't think that we did the Game Boy Color version that's shown there, but 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 uh, we did a Super Nintendo version, and it was the first game that got uh, that Electronic Arts sent to Nintendo that got really, really positive feedback and reviews. And uh, Larry Probst came and said, oh, we got we got our first 40 out of 40 from uh, Nintendo on this game. And I just told him, wow. I just said, well, don't let that, please don't let that influence your buying decision because as, as much as I love this game, it's it's a niche game. It's kind of you know it's Tetris meets meets tower defense kind of uh, uh, kind of game. And uh, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun to work on. It was a lot of fun to uh, produce. Uh, but uh, and it was great that we got that review because it made our relationship Electronic Arts relationship with Nintendo better. At that time our most highly reviewed game was one that we didn't even publish. It was uh, Konami published the very first uh, uh, published Skate or Die for the NES. And uh, that was our very first, that was the very first Nintendo product that came 
I think that was the very first Nintendo product that came from EA. Uh, but we didn't publish it. Konami did. Hmm. Yeah, I see you worked on the Skate or Die. Yep. Tour to, tour to Thrash. <laughs> yeah, that was a side-scrolling game that uh, Michael Kasaka uh, designed and uh, did all the artwork for. And that was, we were just cutting our teeth then on video games and Trip didn't want us to get into the video game business at all and uh oh, we did really? tour to thrash and it didn't it didn't uh it didn't do particularly well and trip wagged his finger at us and said uh i'll oh, see i told you that uh we shouldn't uh we shouldn't do video games mm-hmm. but uh oh uh, yeah tour to the game boy uh, i think i missed one there was one called the search for double it or die too search for double trouble there we go yeah, this is the one I was thinking of. That's the one. That's the scrolling one. Yeah. Well, these guys are pretty popular. I mean, I definitely uh, remember. Matter of fact, I had a question for you from Matt Shergi. He was asking how it was. Were you intimidated <laughs> to work on this series? On, on Madden? No, on uh, Skate or Die. Skate or Die? Well, no. I mean, I was there. I mean, I saw the very first Skate or Die game i mean i worked on uh i worked on the very first skate or die game uh tested it and assistant producer and and uh, all that and uh um i became i became friends with uh that that was done by our very first internal uh development team the late great david bunch and uh, uh michael kasaka and oh now i'm drawing a blank uh, they're gonna. He's gonna kill me. I can see his face. Steve Landrum, the the I, and uh, Rob Hubbard did the uh, the music and sound effects. And he did, he did he did some great stuff for that. That just blew my mind way back in the day. And um, I use one uh, of his yeah. bands for my intro music. <laughs> yeah, I love. He, He's never put out a bad song, as far as I know. No, I don't think so either. No, he he was he was great to work with. He was great. He was great to golf with. <laughs> he was a lot of fun to play golf with. Oh, I didn't uh, know you. Yeah, you were. Yeah, there was uh, some people had asked, and I said you worked on all these sports titles. You know how much of a yeah of an athlete, a sports aficionado are you? I I would say that I am a participant, not a great athlete. Um. Uh, I I have uh, I've run in I've uh, finished many marathons. I have finished an Ironman triathlon. Oh. Uh, I've done the uh, um, tour of um, Lake Tahoe on my bicycle twice, uh, which is a beautiful and uh, challenging ride. They closed the roads for the most part, and you can ride your bike around uh, Lake Tahoe. And uh, for anyone that has the gumption, I, I would definitely recommend that. Uh, amateur golfer, not very good. Uh, but uh, I mean, being an amateur, being an amateur back then, I mean, that got me involved with uh, the PGA Tour golf franchise way back when. And uh, we got that, uh, yeah, you know, Sterling Silver software. And uh, I think that that was the, uh, the very first uh, game, the very first uh, video or computer game that had a, uh, had an actual uh, chip shot where you didn't have to push hundreds of buttons in order to pull it off. It actually had a, a chip shot that you could, uh, you could pull off with just a couple of button presses. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. I mean, I was we, at this. this picture here Patrick looks like a... Tobel were the programmers. <laughs> Cynthia Hamilton, Cynthia Hamilton did a lot of the artwork on this version, and, and uh, again, Rob Hubbard did the the uh, did the music, especially when we moved to the Genesis. And uh, it was just great to it was great to just go down and uh, to uh, PGA Tour headquarters in uh, Ponte Vedra Beach and uh, get that license to uh to do that game yeah the only advantage it wasn't as pretty as links but we ours drew in about two seconds and theirs took even on great hardware back in the day theirs would take 
30 to 45 seconds to uh, to render a scene. So uh, wow. in the time that you could play nine holes on our game, uh, you could probably play three holes of lengths. And uh, I, I remember, um, and then there, I mean, there were three big golf games back then. It was us and uh, we had all of the tour, uh, real tour golf courses and, uh, and uh, those 60 gr gr really good golfers back in the day. And Lynx had nobody, but they were pretty. And then Jack Nicholas golf was his own game. And uh, Larry Probst would come and say, well, we need somebody as big as Nicholas. Why don't you get this Phil Mickelson guy? And Mickelson wouldn't even, wouldn't even talk to us because we wouldn't pay him a, you know, a million dollars up front oh. to, to do it. So, you know, Lefty was never part of the game, but, uh, you know, you still had some uh, Hall of Fame golfers that were on that roster, Paul a Azinger, Mark O'Meara, and uh, Craig Stadler, and uh, a bunch of others that uh, ended up winning major championships. Yeah, Mark McCumber. It's hard to see him on the side. My goodness, and Larry Mize, and Freddie. Freddie Couples, oh, that, yeah, that was, uh, oh. And kind of, uh, you know, you say you're kind of an amateur, and I, I sometimes wonder if maybe that's even an asset when you're making a game about a sport like this, because I could see well, maybe we don't, making it yeah. complicated and inaccessible. You know, you want yeah, to just... Yeah, you want it, you want it to be a game first. You don't, you want to simulate the sport, but you want it to be a game first and that means is that it's got to it's got to hook the it's got to hook the player in and get them to want to play another another hole another round to try to get better to try to get closer to the hole to try to break their course record you know whatever it might be and uh with the pga tour on the genesis uh we were having a uh we got visited by uh, several 49ers players, John Taylor, Jerry Rice, Roger Craig, a couple of others that were on those Super Bowl winning teams, those early Super Bowl winning teams. And uh, we figured, oh, we're, we'll get the whole Madden team in there and uh, they'll want to talk football. And no, that wasn't it at all. They wanted to talk PGA Tour golf and what was going to be in the next one because they would take their Genesis on the and their cartridge on the road with them and then the night before a game they would play skins games against one another in pga tour golf so they were much more interested in what we were doing on the golf game than what we were doing with that that's interesting <laughs> why do you except, think that was uh... it, well, except for the well because it was something that, that they play football all the time they play football for oh, real sure. So, you know, the only part of Madden that they were interested in was what's my number. Of course, that, that's the debate that goes on today, you know, is uh, what's, my, what's my Madden, what's my number in Madden? Yeah, I read yeah. about that. Apparently some of these uh, athletes take that sort of, I mean, understand. Oh, they get offended. They get offended. I, I don't know how, I don't know how the team that uh, works on that uh, uh, does such a good job. I mean, there are just so many players uh, these days, and they, they have to be so adept at, uh, you know, guys getting hurt or dinged up, and oh, that's got to be reflected in their number now, and they'll do a midweek patch, and uh, it, it's just, uh, it's just so interesting how everything has changed, because back then, I mean, we got one shot at everything. Not only did we have to get the thing out in with the current rosters, but we had to per, kind of predict based on our ranking ratings, how they were going to perform that year. Cause we didn't, they didn't want to have last year's guy in there. They wanted to have this year's guy in there. And uh, That's one of the great things about these sports titles, right? Is you always have a good reason to come out with a new. new yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was one of the, the, it's the, the one part of the, the treadmill, a, a, a game like golf, you don't really, in my opinion anyway, you don't need to do one a year. You, you, you can do one every two or three years. You, you can go to the drawing board and you can go, okay, what can we do that's going to make this more fun? 
you know, and so Hot Shots Golf or Everybody's Golf came in there and they did some really fun things and, and everybody's been kind of piggybacking on that, on Camelot's good work for years and years and years and years and years to, uh, to do kind of like that. Uh, the Tiger Woods games came out and, and such and such, but with the a Madden football or, or an NBA game, you're, you're on that continual annual treadmill where you've got to get a new game out there every single season. And uh, the, it, it's challenging. It from a business perspective. It's not impossible. And, and uh, back then it was radical. It was radical thinking. Uh, but what I proposed that what we, what we do was that we have uh, two teams working on Madden football, for example, and we'd have one, one of the teams would be working on this year's Madden and the other team running completely in parallel would be working on the one after that. Oh, so basically wow. they got, they got two years to work on the version of the game. And so they just kind of, they kind of hop one another back and forth. And it was, I was told I was insane back then. And you'll probably tell me that I'm insane right now, but, but being on that, being on that treadmill, uh, it, it is just so difficult. You end up putting out a game that has very few significant new features and you'll see the annual sports game get dinged time and time again for this. In fact, FIFA on the Switch, the people hate it because in spite of the fact that they say, oh, they, they call, they even EA calls it the legacy edition because the engine, the FIFA engine is from years and years ago. And the only thing that they've updated is the rosters. They haven't updated any of the features at all. So they, they, they don't even pretend anymore. They just call it the legacy edition. They blurt it out there. And the people that got to have those new rosters, those, those transfers, they're, they're going to pick it up. But everybody else, yeah, yeah no. So, and, and, you know, Madden and being on the treadmill can also cause, you know, the Madden series to come out with really, really buggy versions. In the last couple of years, I've seen EA get dinged for, uh, a lot of severe bugs in uh, Madden football, in spite of the fact that, of course, since they're the only NFL li official NFL licensee, they're the only football game in town. Must be just a constant source of tension because, I mean, if you don't get it out soon enough, <laughs> yeah, the rosters get behind. So, yeah, that makes it. Uh, Madden Football Friday. I mean, that was what uh, what it was called way back in the day. We had to have all of our versions ready to go and ship on a particular Friday. And there would be uh, people pre-ordered and were just waiting for those uh, those cartridges. You know, one thing about sports games, just as somebody who collects a lot of old games, vintage games and things of that sort, you know, it's... I always wonder what it would feel like to be somebody like you having produced so many of these games because, you know, frankly, when you go to one of these shops and you're in the used games section, there's lots and lots of sports games. And yeah. <laughs> usually pretty discounted. I basically, I don't know how well they age, you know, compared to some of these other, you know, non sports uh, games. And I just kind of wonder, like, what's it like from your perspective? I, I don't think that, um, unfortunately, well, these days, sports games age a little bit better um, because you have player editors. And uh, in fact, uh, ESPN did a, a wonderful story on um, this group of uh, college football fanatics that uh, they spend their uh, off seasons of college football updating all the players for the very last college football game that EA ever produced back on like, I think it was the PS2 or PS3. And, and <laughs> they, they'd spend thousands of hours bringing in these new kids 
and putting them in this game just so that they can play college football. And it's just insane the dedication that some of these folks have. And I'm glad back happy was, to hear that. That's awesome. Back when I was working on Earl Weaver baseball, uh, the computer gaming world guys, Russell Seip and Johnny Wilson, they they exclusively wanted to use Weaver baseball for their baseball league because they had been using dice games, you know, Stratomatic baseball oh to do their uh, baseball league on. And now here was Earl Weaver baseball, and they could do it this other way and, and uh, they could actually see it. Ah. You know, we, we've got to talk about that Stratomatic because that was one of the questions I had for you was, you know, how were you ah, guys playing Eddie that? Hey, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. Woo, without, uh, without Eddie Dombrower or, or Don Daglow, that just doesn't, that game doesn't exist. And of course it's another, uh, it's another hot button of, uh, of, uh, Trip Hawkins as well. Trip is a huge uh, baseball fan, and so he had a lot of input uh, on that game as well. But uh, yeah. yeah, this is a great one. I remember playing this a lot as a kid. I want to say yeah. I had it. I must have had it on the. It, it was the first. It was the first game that I I can ever remember that uh, had all of the stadiums in it. And uh, I remember we did a uh, we did a promotion with Earl Weaver, uh, where we were going to play the uh, All Star game before the All Star game. It was uh, the All Star game was going to be in Oakland, and so we were going to actually have all the press, the regular press and the gaming press, and we were going to get them together, and uh, we were going to pre-play the all-star game before these folks drove up the road to Oakland to watch the actual all-star game. And uh, uh, I got to the hotel and met Mr. Weaver for the very first time. And he was, he was the Earl Weaver that you would think because uh, he was pissed off because somebody at EA had booked Earl Weaver a chain smoker who even smoked in the dugouts of the games that he was managing back in the day, they booked him into a non-smoking room. So he was, he was livid and giving the, the uh, poor hotel clerk all that she could handle uh, before they, uh, they found appropriate co accommodations for him so that he could actually smoke inside of his room. But uh, we have, we had that back in, back in the day and, uh, it was, it was uh, it's, it's Earl Weaver. Come on, you know. It's Earl Weaver. <laughs> you don't tell the you don't tell him he can't smoke. He, he just just great, uh, great to work with Eddie uh, to get that done. And uh, David Maynard, uh, uh, a true legend uh, of uh, EA, did one of the very first games at EA Worms. But on top of that, his technical knowledge and help. That he provided uh, the, to uh, that particular product uh, just cannot be measured. He, Eddie would tell you the same thing. Uh, I mean, he was just so intric in intricate in making sure that that got done. And we were trying to uh, get that done so that we could ship. Um, we wanted to just get it done when it was done, uh, which you hear on a lot of titles because it was going to be our very first baseball game. But um, Tandy, the Radio Shack people, came to Electronic Arts and while we were still working on Earl Weaver for the Amiga. And uh, they told us that if we got Earl Weaver baseball done by a particular date for the a, a Tandy version of Earl Weaver baseball done by a particular date, that they would take 250,000 of them. And when stuff went to Tandy, it never came back. So all of a sudden, the focus of Earl Weaver baseball became, let's tidy up the Amiga and get it out there. But we got to get this Tandy version done because we can sell 250,000 of them. Wow. Because the Amiga wasn't, the Amiga was still a hobbyist computer. And, and although people were really looking forward to Weaver baseball, it was never going to be the, the biggest seller. And, and so 
Uh, I went down and lived in Whittier, California for a few weeks and went to uh, Eddie's house, who uh, was kind enough to put up with me. And uh, we sat in his unair conditioned house and we worked on Earl Weaver baseball day and night for those few weeks and we got we got it done and we replicated that a couple more times and got the candy version done and we sold we ended up selling I think like 350 to 400,000 units to Tandy just them alone uh, without uh, anything else being done but uh, it's nice that there there he is they had a fairly nice graphics adapter on the Tandy is that the Tandy graphics adapter. Yes, yeah, see, yeah, the Tandy graphics was uh, ha had graphics that was uh, similar to uh, what the Amiga could do, um, but uh, yeah, Eddie, it, it just doesn't. Uh, I mean, Don signed Eddie because Don and Eddie worked. Don Daglow and Eddie worked together when both were at Mattel working on Intellivision games. In fact, I think they worked on the Intellivision baseball game, if I remember correctly. They worked on the one of the Intellivision baseball games and uh, signed him to do Weaver once once they both left. And um, that makes sense. I mean, the Intellivision that was their big draw, right? One of those sports. Yeah. Games. Yep. Just bring one of those and up and compare it to Madden. Weaver. Weaver. I, I mean, I was uh, uh, bopping around on the internet and, and uh, a, a British video game reviewing YouTube channel uh, did a list of the 10 most influential sports games of all time. And Earl Weaver baseball was on that list for the, for the right reasons, in my opinion, because, because I said, hey, this is the first game that took stats into account. It was the first game that replicated all of the individual stadiums uh, I mean, all of the all of the things that everybody takes for granted that now, really, really takes for granted now. Weaver was the first game to really do that in a graphical way. Uh, everything up to that point had been all text-based. Stratomatic had a text-based baseball game, but uh, not, nothing compared to Weaver. And uh, yeah, well, Madden was also on that list, but it was more on, honestly, it was more on the list because they got the NFL license exclusively, not, not for the what would have been the right reason, which was that uh, John's influence on the game and, and everybody's passion for working on that football franchise just uh, made it the, the great game that it was and still could be. I've always been intrigued by that Stratomatic game you know i've read a lot of books about the history of dungeons and dragons and they talk a lot about war games and chain mail and this sort of thing but i always looked at those uh those baseball simulation they were football ones too the pen and paper yeah you know and there's a yeah. lot of statistics and i mean i would argue that there's some overlap there with you know what goes on in role-playing games yeah no i i would uh i would agree uh, uh i mean uh uh trip was a big uh Stratomatic uh, uh, baseball player, and uh, they, they they would uh, his little league would play on the computer version of Stratomatic, and and Stratomatic you roll dice, and and they knew the player cards so well that a particular number came up uh, on the screen, and before the computer could tell them what the result of that die roll was. They exclaimed home run because they knew that player card oh. of that particular guy so well that they knew that that was going to was a home run. So uh, you don't get that in Weaver. Weaver had, you know, real wind and real physics and, and it did a lot of things for the uh, uh, in, in a simulation standpoint that that just hadn't been done. Yeah, and so Eddie Eddie rolled up hit types. He didn't roll up results. He said, oh, well, this is going to be a single hit type. But then based upon the players that were out there on the field, it might not be a single. It might get caught by an ex ex uh, uh, extraordinary shortstop, or it might end up being a double because you've got a dog left fielder that, that's slow getting to the ball. 
But really, so this is a lot more realistic and immersive. Yeah. I just remember playing the heck out of this on. I wonder, was there a Commodore sixty four version of this, or am I just imagining? Uh, it was worked on, but I don't. I don't remember if it. I don't think it ever got released. I don't think it ever got released. It certainly, the certainly was worked on, but I don't think that it was. Uh, I don't recall it ever being released. But uh, oh, I, I just. Uh, you got some fond you know, memories of this. I, I just was so. I was so lucky. I, I was so lucky to have been hired into electronic arts at that time. I, I was so lucky to be able to get out of the mail room and work on these games. And then I was so lucky to work with talented, talented people. I, I, I mean, it was just, uh, it was just great. I mean, I, I just, uh, I enjoyed most of my time at Electronic Arts and uh, uh, until such time that it, it wasn't, uh, it, it was, uh, it became the big corporation that it's only become a bigger corporation now. Uh, and, and it stopped being about the games and it started being just about business. I remember talking to, I got the interview trip not too long ago. <laughs> yeah. I remember he sort of had similar, similar thoughts. If I, you know, it's almost like you can be ruined, I guess, by your own success and things just get yeah. too much money. There's too many other people. Uh, I mean, electronic too arts. Elect uh, I mean, electronic arts did so many things. Trip and his team that founded the company, they did so many things right way back in the day. You know, the 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 fact that they spent all that money doing that big We See Farther uh, magazine spread. I mean, it, it indelibly imprinted on an entire generation of gamers' minds that this company was going to be different. And the people that he got to work on, the you know, Bill Budge and Dave Maynard and Dan Bunton, Ozarkowski. Yeah. I mean, all these people that, and then later on, Will Harvey. I mean, these these great Ray Toby, great great programmers and people, and that they decided that they weren't going to ship their product through distributors. That they were going to have their own software distribution division. That was radical back in the day when they were doing it. To, to have their own internal distribution department. It allowed them to keep a better handle on how much product was out there on the field and to get, they had a real relationship with the mom and pop shops and the big chain stores back at that time. Just unbelievable, absolutely key to electronic arts success because once that distribution company was in place, then they brought in all these other labels. And that's how you get origin systems becoming part of electronic arts. They, they were, they could have used anybody, but, but to have EA distribute their product was a big deal to them. It didn't end up well for poor Mr. Garriott and that company at the end of the day. And that's a drag, that's a drag, but, uh, um, it, all of these things that that were done very very early on in electronic arts life that that they got right and, and that uh, trip wanted to have a culture at the company that 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 was great in my opinion because i got in there and i got to see that these people everybody from the accountants to on down it wasn't just the product people that felt this way about the 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 company that they were were working at. Everybody was vested huh? while they were vesting their stock. Uh, they were vested in making this small company succeed. This small private company. I mean, you can't imagine at the time that this company was ever private, but it was. 
<laughs> that was fantastic. I mean, it must have just been a. You must have just been so excited to go to work every day. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, no, it was. It, for the most part, it was. I gotta wonder, like, what what the hell happened? You know what? <laughs> for many many years, I mean, it was a it was a great, wonderful place to to work at, and then of course, certain things change because the company's getting to being a size. I mean, one of the things that changed was that uh, everybody, regardless of what position that they would uh, were hiring for, they wouldn't just be interviewed by their direct chain of command. They would get interviewed by people outside of their department to make sure that that person, that individual was a good fit for the company. Rat, so you could be really, really talented, but if you annoyed the living hell out of somebody, they would just go, "No, he's not right for us. He's talented. He's got uh, he's got his chops down. He she's got his chops down. Their chops down, but they're not right for us." So I mean, when when even when I got my mail, my my fulfillment position, my direct sales position, I interviewed with Trip. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine that? I mean, just. And of course, once that changed, when people stopped interviewing with Trip and some of the other people, then you started seeing the clicks form because the departments were left to their own devices to, to hire who they wanted over what was right for the company culture as a whole. I was wondering about when was that around? Was there a specific moment of well, I, I always, yeah, I don't know, others at the, other, others at the company that back then might disagree with me, but I think that the, the culture at Electronic Arts died when they turned the company values into an acronym. Hmm. The, they, they turned it into action, the action values. And we, we, the company had values long before then and before I came on board uh, but uh, back back when I came on board I mean Trip actually formed a quote unquote culture club cross departmental group of people that were brought together just to pay attention to and continue to breathe life into electronic arts culture and I can't, I can't imagine anybody doing that now. And of course, like I said, that was another thing at Electronic Arts that died out as the company uh, got you know, too big to be able to, to do that anymore. But I mean, the very first uh, company uh, cultural awards came out of that group. We got together and said, okay, well, what are we going to do with uh, with these values? We want to give out these quarterly awards to these great performing team members. So what are we going to do? So we said, okay, well, for, uh, for teamwork, we're going to give out a boat oar because everybody's got to be rowing the boat in the same direction. So they, they're going to get this great big boat oar that they can display in their cube for an entire quarter so that everybody knows what a hero they are. And my favorite one that we came up with was uh, the Integrity uh, Cultural Award. And it was a, it was a, a, a glass cookie jar that had one single Oreo in it. <laughs> and so to have the integrity to not take the last Oreo. There's that no was where we I would never get it from. <laughs> and uh, I, I love, I, I love, I love the fact that uh, there were like ten or twelve of us sitting in a room, and we just bounced these things off of one another until that's what we came up with. And uh, so again, somebody got that cookie jar in their cubicle for a quarter, and of course, being the great people that they were. They wouldn't take the last Oreo, but they would end up filling that cookie jar of Oreos or some other cookie so that people coming to visit them could partake. 
That's great. I'm just thinking about that cookie jar with a one Oreo cookie. <laughs> well, I got a lot of questions uh, happy along these lines. We kind of touched on this already, but you know, people were curious about yeah, where are you sort of how do you sort of balance making a especially a sports title realistic? Yeah, versus, I mean uh, you know, authentic. This is a my friend Robbie was asking this. Uh, but and you know at the same time balancing that with something that's fun, something that's replayable. And do you have a couple? You have an example maybe where there was a case where you're like, okay, yeah, this is how it works in the real life, but we're making a game. You know, where there's right. moments like that. Well, yeah. Well, I, I would uh, I would go back to uh, uh, PGA Tour golf. Uh, there was no way back in the day with any other golf game that you could do a chip shot easily. It was just a very, very abbreviated swing. You just took a really short swing and you hope for the best. Well, in PGA Tour Golf, we decided that we were gonna have a chip shot and we were gonna make certain assumptions based on the fact that you were trying to do a chip shot. And we take your ball lie into account. And of course, we always took the wind into account. But uh, on top of that, it was basically, it was preset so that based on the club you were using, that the percentage of swing was now a percentage of swing for a chip shot and not a full shot. So now you could take your time and plan and strategize about doing your chip shot. And um, so you, that, that's just one example off the top of my head. But I mean, there, there are dozens of other things that you, you, you do in these sports games. Um, you know, a quarterback being able to, in Madden football, for example, it's not realistic that a quarterback can drop back and see the entire field all at once. That's not possible because his, his line of sight through the helmet is such that he's only going to see a segment of the field, but you'll still hear color commentators talk about how he sees the whole field. Well, for most people, what they get in their head is the, they've been spoiled by Madden because in Madden, you drop back and you see all of it. And, and so that, that's one great example where you don't have to pivot and look here, there, or everywhere, you can just throw it. And, and, and uh, is, uh, other games decided that, uh, oh, that's not realistic. So they tried it where you had to pivot and turn your head and look at the right guy and then throw the ball. And of course, those games didn't do well at all because it, it was too much. It was too realistic. There was a golf game at the time we were working on PGA Tour Golf where you actually had to hit a button to cock your wrists and then turn your shoulders. So there were like eight or nine button presses to be able to take a swing and hit the golf ball. Well, is it realistic? Yes, absolutely. You'd have to worry about all that stuff. But was it fun? No. And the game didn't do well and we never heard of that kind of mechanic swing mechanic ever again for another golf game have you ever did you ever play those cinema wear uh oh yeah 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 yeah. back in the day yeah i remember we, talking we, to what's his, his name i want to say his name was jacob bob jacob is that the yeah i remember talking to him about this and he he i mean trying to i'm just going to make up what he said <laughs> but it was something along i, I the mean the, the the very first the very first uh the very first uh anchor desk that we uh put into uh, Lakers versus Celtics in the NBA playoffs that Michael Kasaka put into that game was definitely inspired by what CinemaWare had done with their sports titles before that. I mean, one of the things he talked about was, he said, we're not really making the game, we're not making a simulation of the actual sport or the game. We're trying to simulate right. what people see on TV. Right. You know, and that, yeah, was, no. that just blew my mind. I just had never even thought about like what's oh. the difference. And, like the helmet example is just a perfect example of that. Yeah. 
Yeah, and again, Madden Madden isn't the way that you watch football on TV. You you they only show the game from the end zone level or end zone view for kicking game for field goals and very very occasionally on replay, but very rarely did they show a play in motion from that camera. Everything sideline side view for football on on uh, on television so yeah i i mean it, it, so you're trying to live up to those expectations it, it's it's what you see on tv but it's an idealized version of what you see on tv so that you have fun playing it because if you don't hook them if you don't hook people quick then they're on to the next thing they're, they're just on to the next thing and you have less, I, I, and you have less wiggle room, in my opinion, with the sports game than you have with a quote-unquote regular story game or platformer or you know Castlevania-style Metrovania game, because you have a preconceived notion of what a sports game should be, of what that sport should be, and you don't have that when you're doing a story game. In a story game, the story might take an hour or two before it either hooks you or it fails to hook you. So you, you hear about the game loop, the game loop being addictive or not addictive. And the wonderful people at Supergiant Games that made Hades, my God, did they suck me in. Did they absolutely suck me in with the, the game loop that they have there, trying to get out in the first place and then trying to get out continual additional times to advance the story, to, to get all of the story that, that's baked within that title, which you couldn't believe was actually in that title when you just booted it up for the first time. But with the sports game, you know what football is, you know what baseball is, you know what basketball is, you know what golf is, you know, you have an expectation of what that should be like. And, and if people go in there and they go, Either this isn't real, this isn't my idea of what is realistic, and or I'm not having fun doing this, even though it is realistic, you're done. I was wondering what the comments you got from some of the players you talked to, like the actual athletes who, yeah. played, who played, you know, the games or the sport that they were part of uh, versus the uh, just the fans of the game. Well, with yeah, the, the fans of the game, the, they're into the way the game plays. They're yeah. not, the, you know, it, it, occasionally you'd hear that they'd have a favorite team and they'd go, oh, well, this running back on my favorite team should have a higher rating, ranking, rating. But uh, the actual players, they would be worried about just what their ranking rating was. <laughs> that, that, I can't blame them. I should be higher. I'm faster than this guy. You know, I have better hands than him. So uh, just uh, just uh, all kinds of all kinds of trouble. There is a good, I mean, I'm very curious about this one too. This is a Matt Workler asked this. Do you have any opinions about esports? When whether simulations of actual sports? Uh, it, it's <laughs> interesting because I mean we were uh, again back in the day we were trying to even have I think we even had some. Uh, We'd take a bus on the road and we'd have Madden football tournaments in different cities. Yeah, you're doing and, that and already. Still, and you still see that now, but it's interesting that uh, it's not the sports games that are the most popular esports titles. It's the it's the shooters and the fighting games that are the uh, the that are the uh, big esports titles it's not the it's not the actual sports just i don't understand why why is that uh, but i i think it's because i think it's because it, it's a fantasy setting versus one that you have preconceived notions of what should be happening and, and even with the madden turn with a Madden game, you really have to worry about, there are just so many moving parts, there's so many players that you got to worry about how they're all 
rated that you can't just go in there and go, oh, well, I'm gonna, we're going to take these two guys and we're going to draw two teams out of a hat and they're going to play Madden. Well, I mean, that game could be over before, you know, one gets the Super Bowl champions and the other one gets the two and 14 Detroit Lions or, or some other bad team. And, you know, it's over before it starts, you know, because the, of the mismatch in terms of talent that's actually out there on the, on the field. Whereas in these esports titles, uh, sure, these characters have different statistics and abilities, and, but the players can get used to that guy or gal and know how to use them in an esport situation so they can be a, a video athlete as that person. They're playing a role and then play as that role and be a, a good teammate for their esports team. Whereas with the, uh, with the sports game, it's mostly one-on-one -on -one kind of things. It's kind of like a fighting game in that regard where, where you end up where, where it's just one-on-one -on -one battles. <laughs> Got to be ironic that some of the least good games for esports are <laughs> like you think sports games would be, but I totally yeah. get what you're saying. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Uh, let's see, here's another one. What do you think about sports manager sim games? compared to once where the player is playing the sport? Well, one of the things that um, I, I like just play calling. For a football game, for example, I would much rather, and maybe this is the time that I spent with Coach Madden and Coach Bill Walsh back in the day, and you know, seeing their playbooks and sitting in on sessions, especially with Coach Walsh when he was coaching at Stanford and and knowing what they're going through and what he's got planned that he's going to do and then going out on going and watching them on Saturday and watching him do that magic that he planned for all week where his players know what they're going to do and they go out there and they just do it and and uh, to have it not be reactive. So I always like being the play caller and that's why we for baseball, you could, you could just manage. You didn't have to do the arcade portion of the game. You could just let the, the game play pitch by pitch or one pitch per at bat mm -hmm. and play it that way rather than do the whole I have to pitch, I have to swing, I have to run, I have to do all that. Because that, that was really, that was kind of the cross section that that game was trying to touch on. It's like, it was trying to be everything to everybody, which is really difficult. We wanted to be a, we wanted to be a good arcade game, but it was really important that it be a good simulator of baseball. Mm -hmm. I think, uh you know, in my context, I play a lot of computer role-playing games, but, you know, there, there's certainly oh, me too. there's a lot of arcade action, you know, where you got the sword and it's basically like yeah. a game. Uh, I don't like those as much as the ones where I guess it'd be more like those play calling or play caller style games where you're more like... Yeah, turn-based. Turn-based versus action RPG. So there's like a parallel there, I think, to what we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd much rather, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dragon Quest... Uh, Dragon Quest versus uh, many of the uh, current Final Fantasy games, you know, where where they're, they're kind of action RPGs or, or even uh, I've always uh, uh, liked Dragon Quest for me personally more than playing Zelda because Zelda is a hack and slash mm -hmm. action RPG game, although I still wasted hundreds of hours playing Breath of the Wild. <laughs> <laughs> great game I mean, oh my God. yeah you know happy we're talking oh, yeah i mean and that's that's one of that's one of the other things when, when you work on these sports games you're not just working on a sport you're working on a game and so all of these influences that you can bring in from other game game styles and mechanics i mean for example Kicking, kicking a field goal in John Madden football, doesn't that look a lot like a golf swing meter 
these days. I mean, you kick the ball. It's a golf swing meter. But we didn't, it, it's not a natural football thing, but it ends up being a natural football video game thing because people have seen that before. They're used to that kind of mechanic and they find it to be fun. So that's, that's, that's what it ends up being. And that's the reason these mechanics show up time and time again, right? They just that's they right. Hit, they hit upon something sort of fundamental. That's right. Yeah, and you you steal from you steal from everywhere and everything. A absolutely everywhere and everything. Every every genre that you can uh, possibly get your hands on to try and uh, and build your uh, your sports title or any other title. Yeah, so we were talking about how the people that play football don't necessarily want to play the football game. You know, right? <laughs> you know, from your point of view, somebody that makes these sports games, you find like, oh my god, I don't want to go home and play sports games. You know, is that you or? Yeah, yeah. no, I play. I I play, and <laughs> unless I was actually wor working on the game, and therefore I was responsible for the playbook in a Madden game or how statistically things were turning out in, in Weaver baseball or, or, or whatever. Uh, I'd say the one exception was uh, uh, PGA, PGA Tour Golf because the, that, uh, I've just always had an affinity. I've always had a love for golf games. So uh, I just, uh, I always like playing that game because you could always do one stroke better. So that would be one that we'd come back to, even though we weren't testing it at the time. And then, of course, like I said, the Hot Shots Golf phenomenon and, and what Camelot did to that genre uh, is just incredible, what, what, they, what they ended up doing. But uh, yeah, no, I'll play. I would go home and I'd play just about anything other than a sports game. So it's just like I, I would I, I, I would go home from working on a sports game and I'd get, OK, I need to blow something up. So I'm going to boot up my PlayStation. I'm going to play Ratchet and Clank. Thank you, Insomniac. Thank you. Thank you. Love Ratchet and Clank. Always have. <laughs> yeah, speaking, I mean, you've worked on so many different platforms. Yeah. Consoles and computers. And you know, we talked about a lot of them here. You know, were there can you were there certain stories that you have maybe or some fun memories or maybe not so fun memories or you're like okay we got to try to do this game try to do this thing on this you know the game boy or whatever it is and you're like oh we just well, can't I, do this or we're gonna have there to like just, there were just certain things that uh that you Way back when we were working on the Super Nintendo, we had heard a rumor that um, they were working on a uh, multi-port of some sort so that you could play with four or five players at the same time rather than just two because that's all that the SNES had. And... Uh, we on the Genesis, we actually, Electronic Arts actually put out a uh, four player dongle for the Genesis so that you could play Madden or NHL and play it with four players. So we were already kind of adept at that. And um, uh, we had a couple of teams working on uh, Madden football at that time. And uh, I, I'll never forget when uh, John Shepard, who uh, would later be the head of all things Madden, uh, him and Visual Concepts Greg Thomas came down with their latest build of Madden and they had imported one of these multi-port things for the SNES and they plugged it in and voila, five of us were playing Madden football at the same time utterly unbelievable at that time and, and playing it smoothly and easily and freely and being able to have all the controls that we wanted to have and seeing Shepard's smug smile at the at that time because he had he had 
he was passionate about doing it at the time. He wanted to get everything that he possibly could out of that stinking machine. And so he, he had worked on his own time to put that in there. But, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's really amazing. Uh, getting to meet a lot of the people that I got to meet, not just sports people, but other people. Um, Will Harvey did a game called uh, The Immortal. Oh, yeah, we, The Immortal. We haven't talked about that one yet. And, and we, he, we were just finishing up a version on the uh, NES. And of all people, uh, Stan Winston and James Cameron came in to visit us at Electronic Arts. And I demoed the immortal for James Cameron and Dan awesome Winston. And I, I mean, and so I got to the first major encounter and I cut the guy right in half and he split and, and Stan Winston went absolutely nuts. He just all oh, started he started shaking Cameron by the shoulders. He go, oh, oh, did you see? Did you see how that one half of the goblin fell faster than the other half? And of course, that was something that Will and his artists put into the game. But these other people outside of our industry got it. They, they got what, what he was going for, that kind of cinematic play style and... and what he did, they he, they got it, and, and uh, it was just really neat to uh, all the wonderful people that I, I I just was so lucky to meet at that time, just because you know I was I was forced gumping my way through life, just <laughs> ping ponging around, and you know the the people that I got to meet, you know the Earl Weavers and the John Maddens and the Bill Walshes, those were all product specific but then there were other people that i got to meet that that were just that there's no way i ever would have met them outside of outside of just the fact that i i was working on these games i never would there would have never been a reason for me to have, have met uh uh jerry rice or john taylor but there they were sitting there playing pga tour golf one day in our in our conference room and they wanted to. They wanted to hear from me what was going to be next. And I went, God, Jerry, can I run up the hill with you? You know, I mean, they were more interested in that. But uh, you know, that that's just just pure luck. And then that, the, and that's just the external people. And then you talk about all of the the wonderful, talented people that were at Electronic Arts or that worked with Electronic Arts as programming teams outside contractors or internal employees just this myriad of very very talented people that that work there that you were just i wasn't as much of a sponge as i should have been at the time i didn't appreciate it as much as i should have at the time that i was living it and, and uh the 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 one real regret that I have from that time was that I would I was I didn't soak as much of that up as I is I now wish that I would have because it was it was a it was a wonderful opportunity I, I can only imagine I mean it, it was probably like being one of Walt Disney's seven old men back in the day you know be, being part of that team or one of the original Imagineers working on Disneyland. I, I mean, and all of those people, those teams that were working together at that time, I, I, I could, it's the only parallels that I can come up with. And it's only from reading memoirs that I can even say, yeah, that was kind of like it was for us when we'd go into this conference room at the end of the week and we'd be, people would be drinking beer and eating chips and drinking soda and there were all of these computer game and video game Hall of Famers, Cooperstown Hall of Famers, sitting there drinking, drinking and eating with you at the end of your regular work week. I mean, just, just unbelievable cast of characters, and uh, I, I miss it. And the one thing that I 
that I do now on a, on a monthly basis is that uh, that group has a regular monthly Zoom meeting oh, wow. where we, we get together and we, we talk about things that are going on in the world now and, and we talk about things from, from back in the day. And, and uh, if uh, the w talented, wonderful and gracious Marjorie Martin uh, didn't organize these things. I, I, I'm not sure that they would they would happen, but they but they do, and, and they've given me a reason to try to get to the next one. <laughs> you know, I just want to want I want to get to the to the next EA monthly meeting so that I can uh, see some of these people that I have such uh, warm feelings and admiration for. So many of them, they were they were they were great back then, and they're. Still they're great human beings now, and uh, they, they're they not the Trip Hawkins of the world, but they were absolutely instrumental in uh, electronic art success, absolutely instrumental in the success, the, the birth, founding, and, and success of that company. Yeah, it's just really awesome that you're still meeting regularly. I mean, that's, <laughs> that says a lot in and of itself. Well, uh, I was just so glad you took the time, you know, to. Uh, I'm glad to be able to spend the time with you to, to be able to talk about all this stuff. I'm, I'm still, as you might be able to tell, I'm still passionate about this stuff. Oh, absolutely. Not, not just the stuff that, that I worked on, but the stuff that's going on out there today. I'm still, I mean, it started when I was a very young kid and I would take rules and parts from several different board games and make up my own rules and make a completely different game. So, I mean, it started way back before there was even an Atari 2600, way back in the day, before there was even Pong. I was doing this with my, my little board games and, and stuff all the way through the early video games and computer games, the early Apple II games. And, uh, you know, when uh, my my D and D group at the time, when Ultima One came out, way way back when on the Apple Apple Two, and it came in one of those Ziploc baggies that you were talking about, and um, we 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 got into it. People, my group really got into it, and so we would play for we would play for a few hours of D and D, and then we'd take turns playing Ultima One with our character, one character each, of course. So <clears throat> we had to have an egg, we had to have a timer, one of those hour cooking timers, so that when your hour was up, you had to save, you had to get off of that machine because the next guy was up. And, and, and being D&D &D enthusiasts at that time, we were just going, oh, well, this is the, this is the future of what D&D &D is gonna be like, and of course, it, even at that time, we had no idea what was going on in Japan. You know, we had no idea that there was there was the this burgeoning. We didn't hadn't even heard of the NES. We hadn't heard of Final Fantasy. We hadn't heard of Dragon Quest. We hadn't heard of any of this stuff. But Ultima, with Richard Garriott, or British, who who did all all of this, where he had space travel and dungeons and and uh, all this adventuring, just just unbelievable. And you see it time and time again. I mean, I love the Mario games. I love all of this stuff that's still going on out there in the in the world of, of video games. And, and these days, we never could have imagined back in the day when we were just struggling to keep the lights on from month to month that the video game industry is now bigger than the movie industry. And it just, that's unfathomable back in, in the day. Of course, most movie tie-in games still suck rocks, but, <laughs> but the industry has built, they build their, these teams of people, they build their own movies. You know, the, the Rockstar team, they build they build Grand Theft Auto and all of the wonderful characters and storylines and the gameplay and oh, I mean, it's just 
wonderful or CD Projekt Red and The Witcher 3. Oh boy. I mean, just these wonderful teams of people that get together and still work on these things that I can spend hundreds of hours playing with and never see all of it. And that's just, and then I'll see somebody streaming it. I'll see somebody streaming uh, Mario Odyssey or something like that. And I go, oh my God, how did he do that? How did he possibly do that? I've played that same game. I have so many of these stars, but I've never been able to pull off this cappy jump, dump, jump to jump to jump that they do. My God, it, it, it's just uh, amazing where people take these games, building them and then playing them. It's just amazing. I, I think that we're still creatively at the infancy of, of what interactive entertainment can bring. What do you think's in the future then? I don't know. I, I mean, I keep, people want to say it's VR, but I just, I'm I not so. about sold. VR and AR and this kind I, of stuff. But I, I still feel like that, that that's just such a gimmick. I just think that um, I, the future is these teams building tools that make it easier for them to tell stories. That's what it comes down to, because I am confident that if they build tools that are easy for them to use, where they can churn out these engaging storylines, that they can find talented writers to fill that with a world that'll be interesting to others. Hmm. But it's, it always comes back to this, this, this why the, these teams, they go, oh, well, it's an open world game. Oh, it's a souls, it's a souls like, it's a rogue like, but it's not the same. I mean, in my opinion, there, there's Hades, which is way up here. And then there are all these other rogue likes that are, that are down here. Uh, I mean, I, I, that, that was the, that was the best that was the best 200 hours of, of my pandemic was playing Hades what, what, uh, back when nobody could go anywhere. Um, that and, and of course, Animal Crossing, which everybody, Animal Crossing, uh, New Horizons that everybody got uh, hooked on as well. But uh, I mean, I just, it comes back down to the talented people that are the talented technical people that are building the tools that make these worlds possible, sports and otherwise. They're the, they're the heroes of this business and I don't see that changing anytime in the future. Hmm. That's why I looked up to people like, uh, like uh, uh, Dan Bunton and, and uh, Will Harvey and Ray Toby and, and Dave Maynard and all these guys and Eddie Dombrower because they were the guys that were actually doing it. They were the ones twiddling the bits to make it do what we wanted it to do and what we could enjoy doing. Well, just to kind of wrap up here, the one question <laughs> I always like to ask people, you know, especially people that have a lot of experience across a broad range of the industry, is you know, what would you, what kind of advice would you give somebody? especially a young person who's really passionate yeah. about games, wants to That's, have a career, doesn't the, know really how to get, I mean, we talked about calling up and complaining about a game delivery. I mean, yeah. that might be a strategy. I, I don't think, that, I don't think that that would work anymore. <laughs> you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't be employee 53 anymore. You'd be employee 5,300. So, uh, I mean, uh, doing that is probably not going to work, but uh, I mean, because of the indie scene, it, there's both a lot less opportunity and there's a lot more opportunity because you can end up being able to, if you look hard enough, you can find these individuals or these great small units of creative people and talented people that you have the, the, the chance to work that you might have the chance to work with 
to, to, to build your resume. And the first thing that I tell people is just, is just, just because you enjoy playing games doesn't mean that you're going to enjoy working on them. And, and we, we, we had our share of burnout working on the sports games back in the day because we had lots of Madden fans and lots of NHL fans that would come and work with us for a summer as interns. And by the end of the summer, they couldn't wait to get back to, to college to oh, wow. get back to the books, except for Gordon Bellamy, uh, who is an, another great talent uh, that, that came in and, and uh, turned it into a, a career for himself. But, but uh, I mean, that just it's not the playing a game and working on a game is not the same thing. And as long as you have realistic expectations uh, of what it what it could be to actually work on a game and worry about pixels and textures and uh, 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 button mapping and, and menu flow and things like that, rather than what it is playing the game moment to moment, then then you could you could have a future in this industry. And, and of course, if you're one of those people that I can only that, like I said, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with so many of those those people. It, it is that if you have the talent where you're both creative and a, a technical genius, where you can twiddle the bits and make things do what you want them to do on screen, or orally via music like Rob music and sound effects like Rob Hubbard then the world is your oyster because people are going to come looking for you because they need, the industry needs you. So, you know, math, math is important. Gameplay is important. Technical, technical uh, chops are important. But, you know, I, the, the thing that you can't replace though is passion. If you have no passion for it, if it's just a nine to five job, then you should try to find something else to do. Because, because regardless of whether you're working, uh, especially in an indie studio, but I mean, I can't imagine even, even working, uh, trying to build the next Call of Duty or the next Madden, if you don't have passion for what you're doing, then it's gonna show up on the screen and million, now millions of people are gonna look at it and they're gonna tell you that you were dispassionate when you built this because it's gonna show, it, it's gonna show. It's gonna end up in the end result and it's gonna be unpolished. It's not gonna be as good as it could be or as that it should have been. Words of wisdom. <laughs> But I always, always, un unfortunately, like I said, I ended up working on a lot of these sports games and uh, un unfortunately sports games are seasonal. So you, you end up not being able to look, look the press in the eye and go, well, well, it'll be done when it's done, you know, which is the one, the one thing that, that you always want to, it, it'll be, when it's done, we'll ship it. That's what you want to be able to say. Uh, but you have to have a lot of uh, support and faith in your vision and, and the money <laughs> to be able to keep the doors open long enough to, to actually be able to do that. Yeah, I just remember talking to Brian Fargo one time. And, you oh. know, I was just such a big fan. I didn't appreciate Brian when I worked for him. He, I didn't appreciate Brian enough when I worked for him or with, with him. I, I mean, he, he is, he is great. Yeah. He just talked about how he would, you know, he'd introduce himself at one of these game conferences or whatever. And they'd be like, Oh yes, we worked on Bard's tale and you know, this, that, and the other thing. And nobody would know <laughs> what <laughs> nobody Bard's tale was. Yeah. I'm like, Oh my God, really? They don't hear. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, look at, uh, look at, look at fallout. I mean, fallout people, people don't even know. Uh, mo most people don't know that Fallout came from Wasteland, which, which was which was Brian and Interplay's game. I mean, which I fell in love with. I love that. I absolutely love that game. And, and, and again, tricky 
um, uh, copy protection because you'd have to refer to lines in the manual in order to progress through the game. At, at some point during the game, you'd have to refer and pick a particular response out of the manual so that you could continue because we had copy protection problems up the walls in. Yeah, that was a good reason for the one of the big advantages, I guess, with these console versions of games, less less piracy to deal with. Yeah, le it's still there, but less. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, with all the emulators, with all the emulators now, uh, I mean, people are still unfortunately getting robbed of what should be their their birthright because they created a game that somebody's downloading the ROM of illegally and playing on their on their uh, machine it, it it's a shame but uh but it, it happens it's probably it, it's just that now since games sell in the millions of units rather than in the tens to hundreds of thousands of units it's not felt as harshly as it was back in the day i mean we would we would hope back in the day that our game that the games were good enough before video games, the computer games on the Commodore 64, Apple II, early PC Tandy, that they'd sell even 100,000 units. That was a big deal to have a game sell 100,000 units. Now these games go out there in the world and they sell 2.5 million in their first weekend. And it's just, just amazing, amazing what can happen. Well, we've talked about a lot of stuff here. Is there anything yeah, I think so. we haven't uh, gotten to that you were? No, I, I just appreciate, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, I was going to say this, you know, the reason I brought up uh, Brian Fargo, just people not Yeah. Know. I bet anybody, <laughs> you, would, you know, that you see somebody playing Madden and you're like, oh yeah, I, I worked on that series. I mean, they, they know that series if they don't know anything about but I mean, the, 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 that series, the, 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 everybody, the everybody, famous, uh, franchise everybody, everybody that's ever played John Madden football should bow down and, and give thanks to a very few people, Jim Simmons, Scott Orr, Richard Hilleman, Trip Hawkins, John Madden. Those, that's the, that's the Mountain Rushmore of John Madden football. If it weren't for those people, you don't have what you, if you're still enjoying it, you don't have Madden football today. Though the Jim Simmons was the original programmer of the Genesis version of John Madden football. And without him and without Scott Orr's, game tuning brilliance and game design instincts there is no there there is no madden football today i don't think or it's it's not the phenomenon yeah yeah roz ha roz took that picture oh how funny oh you remember this this photo wow yeah, no, I, and I, I remember who took it. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah, he's the, without, uh, the, without those people, I, I mean, I got, I got to work with Jim on, on a few of the games. I got to work with him on, on the Walsh College football. I got to work with him on madden but uh, on the later versions of madden but without him building that original engine then you know it just doesn't have it just doesn't happen yeah scott hey i'm there to sign credits <laughs> yeah i see the, the trio scott was i learned so much from scott scott was a great guy to work for i mean he really wasn't and, and uh oh, he doesn't have a picture i loved i loved um I loved interviewing uh, Coach Walsh. I mean, he was, uh, God rest his soul. Uh, I mean, it's a shame that he was taken from us uh, uh, so, so soon. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't get to live the, the long life that uh, John Madden did. But uh, no, he was, uh, he was such a sensitive man.
and uh, just just a, a really really smart man. And uh, the the toughest question or the toughest subject that I had to bring up with him was the way that uh, Paul Brown screwed him back in Cincinnati when he was the offensive coordinator there. When he they when Paul Brown passed him over for the head coaching job. So I, I, I talked to him about that and, and I uh, said to him uh, after we'd finished the first version of the game, I said, now, now be honest, Bill, when the 49ers beat the Bengals in Super Bowl 16, you were really, really happy to twist the knife in Paul Brown's back and he just chuckled. <laughs> So I, I mean that those, I mean I just um, working with those people. But like I said, the, the, those few people they're responsible. And I mean Jim worked on the first NHL games too. So I mean again, it, without without him, without Scott, without Richard, who is a a hobbyist hockey player and worked like hell to bring. NHL hockey to electronic arts in the first place. They're going, oh, no, no, no. Hockey games don't sell. Hockey games don't sell. And then, you know, a year later, NHL is selling almost cartridge for cartridge with uh, Madden football. Almost. <laughs> Not quite. <clears throat> I don't, I don't, do you remember that, what was it, EA Widow or EA Spouse? Do you remember that? What, where the people sure were working hundred hour weeks and things like that. I mean, so long, I don't really remember all the details. I just, for some reason, was thinking about that. It was something to do with like the long hours or the crunch times or something. There was there was a time that uh, when, when you were there. Or was, sounds like well, it. it really depended on what you were working on. There was a time for me personally where uh, I ended up working a year and a half of. Uh, 80 plus hour weeks in order to make sure that uh, certain products made their ship dates, both cartridge and computer. And that was before the company went public. And so there, we had all these milestones that we had to meet in terms of sales and in terms of release schedule before we could take the company public. And uh, working on many of those titles, I wasn't the, I wasn't the only one but, but I was one of those people that, that because of that, uh, I, I, had, I had that horrible schedule for a year and a half. And I even had to put off uh, back, back then, Electronic Arts had a uh, sabbatical program where after seven years, you got seven weeks of paid sabbatical off. Oh, that's and I, nice. I even had to get permission to post my, postpone mine by a year in order to fulfill this, these, these uh, uh, gaming milestones that needed to be met. So I put it off a year and I went on my sabbatical leave in my, my, eight, my eighth year, after my eighth year. So uh, yeah, I mean, I understand that crunch culture is never a good thing. And, and I think that you end up you end up missing more things. The, the more you crunch, the more that I feel that that uh, your entire team misses things that they would have caught, and your game ends up going out there into the world and being less polished than it could have been or should have been. And <clears throat> you also reach the the uh, point of diminishing returns because back back in the day there were only a couple of people working on it, and so. You, management would come to you and go well what if we put we added this person to the team could we get it quicker it's trying to advance things and, mm -hmm. and there's a point of diminishing returns where just throwing another body on the problem doesn't save you time and it might end up actually hurting hurting things as they come up to speed on what it is to work on the on the product in that environment as they're learning to do it art assets uh, maybe you can throw more art artists at it and have it but again you could run into a style problem with that 
Mm -hmm. because then your styles might not match what's what's going on but but certainly the uh with the technical side where throwing another programmer at it doesn't necessarily uh fix or help the the issue that you're having and, and it's hard to believe now when you hear about these games being built by hundreds of teams of hundreds of people that you know again i i give you those those four or five people that worked on John Madden football, that was it. I mean, that was really it. I mean, sure, there were those of us in support, our produ assistant producers, associate producers, and, and, and design help and things like that. But th those are support people. It was those four or five people that actually built the game. And now you've got these teams of hundreds of people that are responsible for a single title, a single skew of a single title. It's just, it's amazing how this, this industry has changed and grown. I was wondering how many people were on this Hades team. I think it's Supergiant Games, is that it? Supergiant, Supergiant. How big is that? I, I mean, Greg Cassavin and his, and his team there. I mean, I can't imagine that, that uh, I, I, I watched the uh, no clip uh, documentary on that and i can't remember ever seeing more than about a dozen people you know it just a dozen a or 20 small people. independent game studio <laughs> yeah <laughs> like yeah so small is that 100 people these days i think small team i'm thinking like a dozen max right yeah i, I think that they might have you know 20 or 25 people but i i mean and and those guys were all filling wearing many many hats you know you you had the musician you had the programmers doing voices for the game and and things like that i mean you, you never see that anymore at a, at a triple a studio but hades i don't want to insult them i mean hades <laughs> is a triple a game regardless of the fact that it didn't come from a triple a studio and if you were doing it all over again or starting out today would you be looking for the small studios yeah, I, I'd be looking. I would be, I would be looking for a garage band, where where I'd be looking for a garage band where where the, where I could, uh, where my passion could help build something, hopefully special, that other people would get a kick out of interacting with. I mean, when when uh, my, our games would go out there, I would go to the electronics boutique or Babbage's or what, whatever might be in the area. And they'd have their, <coughs> their demo units there. And if they were, were playing one of the games that I would work on, I would just surreptitiously look over their shoulder <laughs> and I would want to see if they were having fun playing with something that I helped build. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing more to me anyway, there's nothing more gratifying than having somebody come back and say, Oh, I had such a great time playing with this game and knowing that you poured your, your heart, mind, and soul into, into it, you know, that your team built that game and now other people are able to enjoy it. They're, I just, it's gotta be the same feeling that the Pixar people feel when they release a new movie and it, it gets, you know, 95 out of 100 on Rotten Tomatoes and 100 million at the box office. They must feel very gratified that that, that uh, all, all of those textures that they pushed and and uh, all of those great animation tools that they built are end up with such a result that it's so pleasing to uh, everyone else out there in the world. I've often thought about that too, but I mean, one of the things I think about with games. You know, if you, even if you love a movie, you're going to watch it, what, maybe? I mean, how many times are you really going to watch this movie? You know, it's two right. hours, maybe three hours. Right. Typical video game, what, hundreds, maybe thousands of hours somebody pours in things? I really, one of the things that I really like about the, the current uh, video game marketplace is that there are there's a marketplace for games that you can finish in just a couple of hours and people are totally satisfied that they they got everything that they wanted out of their dollars during those few hours of playing it 
And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have these other games that take hundreds of hours to complete and a hundred or more hours to complete and even more hours that you could spend playing them if you really want to drill down and get everything out of it that you possibly can. It, it, it's just, it's awesome to me that you, you have this segmentation where not every game is expected to consume 40 plus hours of time where you have these games that go out there and for $5 or $10, they go out there and they take five to 10 hours to complete. But when you've completed those five or 10 hours, you've had your, you've gotten your fun out of it. You've gotten your $10 worth. You, you feel like maybe even that was a great value and you've gotten more than your $10 worth out of that. I, I just think that that's wonderful. That, yeah. Even even just you know five hours that's a pretty good entertainment value if you think about yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How can you beat that? For, you know. Right. Yeah, this is, the Stanley Parable doesn't take very long to get through, but it's hilarious and it's great. Game. It's it's great that 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 somebody insane came up with that concept and delivered on it. I mean, not only when you think of all the things, I mean. Having worked on games, that's that's what is amazing to me, is that not only did you have to have the idea and the talent, but but to follow through on it to the nth degree, the Hades team going, we don't want the goal to be getting out of hell once. We want you to feel intrigued enough that you want to get out five or 10 or 12 times we we want to put another carrot on a stick in front of you so that you feel compelled to to do that to be that insane to think that people are going to want to do that and then deliver on it to to actually deliver on it where where people actually do it people actually play it over and over and over over again people go back and they play the Stanley parable. They come out with a new version. They play through something that they've already played through. And they give the, get, they give that team more money just so they can play through it again, just because there's a little bit more content in here. Take my money. I, I, it's just, it's just great. You don't, you don't get that in the movie industry. And, and, and uh, you just don't get that outside of outside of gaming. I don't think. Yeah, I remember the, the Stanley Parable is one of my favorites. I like to share that. Yeah. One. You know, when I have a, every now and then I'll teach a game studies course and I'll throw that game at people. I won't tell them anything about it. It's like, just play this game and they'll play it. You know, because if you just play it the first time, it's over. And like, yeah. They're like, that's it. That's it. Yeah. But they're always curious enough to like want to replay it and re. That's replay right. It and it gets Try them. different things. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it is. It, 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 it's a contained sandbox and the more the more paths that you want to go down the more paths as you discover and and oh it, it's just i i, I just uh, or or undertale the the, the oh, fact yeah, that, you end that up, one too is another great you, you end up you end up with a with a pacifist run through you know when I first heard about that, I'd already been bludgeoning everybody, so I didn't even know. I didn't even know that that was in there, and, and having to uninstall and reinstall so I could go back and and do it clean and yeah. do a, a true pacifist run. I, I mean, just how were you that crazy to think that that was that that was a good idea, and then not to not to have such faith in your own talent to know that it was a good idea but then to deliver upon uh, on the other side to deliver such a, a a tremendous outcome to the person playing it it yeah undertale's another one of those where you feel like they're they're sort of playing they know what you expect yeah and they intentionally mess with you yeah <laughs> <laughs> You know, I just thought that was just so clever, both of those games. I mean, the Undertale, you think you're saving the game and it's just going to be like a regular, <laughs> you know, experience. Yeah. It, and then you're and like, then oh, my God. Uh, 
Okay, I didn't see what what is happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't want to spoil it for people that haven't. Uh, no. If you haven't played those two games, Undertale or three games, I guess we've talked about now. Maybe we could sell some copies of those for, for those folks. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I still wish I still wish I had uh, after seeing what happened after uh, poor John Madden passed away. I still wish I had a sealed copy of the first version of uh, John Madden football on the cartridge, uh, say Genesis cartridge, because I saw in the days afterwards where those auctioned off for like $150,000 wow, yes. for a single Genesis cartridge of, uh, of Madden football. You must have some great mementos and things that you've collected. Yeah. Do you, know, yeah. you have a big collection somewhere? Like a <laughs> I did. I did. Footballs and I had, yeah, I had a, uh, I had, I had to get rid of it, but I had a, uh, I had a, an Olympic basketball that was signed by the entire uh, dream team. The only one that ever should have been wow. called the dream team. So Magic and Larry and Michael and John Stockton and Carl Malone, blah, 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 on and on. I mean, it, it was just, uh, that was unbelievable. And getting to go up, we were working on the Team USA basketball game and uh, going up to the uh, Tournament of the Americas and watching the Dream Team uh, practice and, against one another. And they would go harder at one another than they'd ever go against anybody else and trash talking the whole time. And uh, I mean, just, just unbelievable. And, and then they played their first game against Cuba. And um, at about 10 minutes to go in the first half, it was uh, USA 49 and Cuba 5. That was the score. And I looked down at the bench and I saw Chuck Daly, the coach, going like this to his team. Settle down. Easy, guys. Easy, easy. A and then they stopped playing uh, defense is hard because they were just working so hard on the defensive end of the uh, of the floor that Cuba couldn't get anything going at all. And after the game, the Cuban coach, I couldn't believe it. He, he said, oh, this team will get beaten in Barcelona. They don't play very good defense. And I went, don't play very good defense. Are you insane? If Chuck Daly hadn't have called off the dogs, your team wouldn't have scored double digits. And, and, and uh, you know, to be able to be so lucky as to see all, all of that talent. Like, again, I was force gumping through my electronic arts career, just being fortunate enough to have been at that place at that time, to be working on the basketball franchise, to then be told by Larry Probst, we just bought the USA Olympic license because they're gonna to put together a dream team and you're working on it. To, to, to be able to be that fortunate and to have Lisa Ching and Edwin and, and the others come through so spectacularly to build it and then Cynthia Hamilton building all of the crazy, weird signature move animations that that she built for the, that game. I, I mean, it was just, I don't think it could, I don't think it could happen today. I think it was, it was just uh, um, of that particular time that, that um, and like I said, I didn't I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have. Now I look back on it and I go, how how was I in all these places you during the real, this compressed the period of time and meeting all of these people? How? And, but you know, I was I was there. Half my ticket stub wow. there there. <laughs> You don't have to be that person that's like, oh, if I had only been there. Yeah. <laughs> Got to see it. I mean, that is awesome. Yeah. I mean, and no, no, there will, there will never be a basketball team as good as, in my opinion, there will never be a basketball team that was good as good as, as that basketball team 
was. And the way that they, that the, the other frustrating thing or the other, the only other time that I saw the coaching staff get frustrated with, um, with team USA was they'd come down the floor and they'd pass the ball and they'd move the ball around and they'd, they'd be, be looking around and trying to score, of course, but every single one of the, the players with one exception, and that was Charles Barkley were so unselfish that they would always be trying to make a better pass to, to get, their 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 teammate more wide open that they, they they would just be working so hard just to get the best shot possible where the the bench you'd hear the coaching staff yell at her shoot the damn ball shoot it you know that the, the, they didn't want him to you know get a good shot and take the good shot but they wanted to get the perfect pass and the perfect shot and that was just the way that 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 team was built. And that's not to say that Charles didn't pass the ball occasionally, but he, he was the one where if he got in a position to take the ball to the hole, he was going to take the ball to the hole. It sounds a little bit like the dream team that you were part of there. <laughs> Lucky enough. Yeah. I was, uh, I was the, uh, water, I was the water carrier for the, for the, for the real talent. Hey, I'd be happy to have that role. Jim Simmons, Scott Orr, Rich Hilleman, <laughs> Rob Hubbard, Michael Casaga. You know, I mean, those guys are the talent, and I carry the water and make sure that they have good feedback and a, a, a good design to work from and, and the support that they need so that they can let their talent flow. Or your humble guy. <laughs> Anyway, it's been a great pleasure to, uh, chatting with you. Nice talking with you, Matt. I appreciate it. Yeah, keep in touch. Keep in touch. I'll. Uh... Yeah, I will. I will. Now that I, now that uh, I've got your email address, I'll definitely be emailing you back. And if you have any other questions for me, or you you hear about somebody that wants to get in touch, I mean, I'd love to. I'd love to hear from folks. Sure. Let's uh, back up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so yeah i didn't i didn't even i didn't even get a chance i didn't even get a chance to talk about bonus some of the material here that i didn't that i didn't get a chance to sign i mean I, I actually signed epic games to a couple of products i worked on a game called firefight that got pc game action game of the year and, and I worked on uh, Extreme Pinball that Cliff Blazinski oh, yeah, actually built and, and worked on that. And, and part, I liked their games when they were just an independent shareware publisher. But on top of that, I had heard that they were working on this other thing called Unreal, the Unreal Engine. And I, I flew out there and I took a look at it and I... I knew from the moment that I saw it that it was a game changer for the industry. I, I, I just, I, I got tingles up and down my spine when I first saw it. And unfortunately, we couldn't, we didn't come to terms with them to work on Unreal. And uh, that was my fault. I was too much of a, I was, if uh, if uh, if Richard Hildeman would have brought that uh, technology to Electronic Arts at that time, it would have been signed, and and uh, it would have been worked on. But uh, because I was such a red ass uh, back in back in the day, uh, and um, uh, too opinionated, too many times for my own good. Um, uh, um, I wasn't listened to as much as I would have liked. I was listened to enough, but but not as much as what was necessary at that time. You know, because part of it was like, well, why don't we just build this ourselves? Or how does this compare to Quake? You know, and and it's just like you're you're not thinking of it right. This is a whole technology of tools where they built the they built the great tool first, and the stories 
that you can tell with this tool set are unlimited. And all that management at EA could see was, how is this going to be Quake? And they didn't understand that it didn't have to be Quake. It could be anything that this was a tool set that was going to free up people, less technical people, less talented people to build something incredible. And, and it's only become that that engine's only become more and more robust over the years. And uh, it, it is to my, my great regret that, uh, that I wasn't able to push that one across the push that one across the goal line. Definitely my fault. They just didn't see the potential, I guess. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was. It yeah, sort of why, why can't we? Hindsight I mean, is twenty twenty, you know. But uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> but you know, I, I mean, I could see it. You know, I because the only thing I had at the time was I had I had only signed them to these two little games. You know, this this top down pinball game, and this this crazy Windows shooter game that played in Windows 95 natively, which was a big deal back then. It was one of the few games that played and played well in Windows 95 natively. And here I was, and they just couldn't, I guess they couldn't get the, the jump in context to realize that what I was trying to sell our company then was this technological suite, not a game. They wanted to know, like I said, how is this going to be Quake? Well, it doesn't have to be Quake. It can be anything you want it to be. I was thinking all the stuff. Well, then did. why can't we build it ourselves? It says we can, but it's going to take us years and the same inspiration and finding the same talent to be able to build it like they've already got running. You know, so, it, you know, has, has Electronic Arts in that time built something as technologically advanced as what Unreal Engine has turned out to be. It's got my mind just reeling with like, what what the sort of what if scenarios, you know, what if that had gone through? And <laughs> oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Maybe and, it's probably looking at a totally different set of uh, games. Right? And unfortunately, seeing how Electronic Arts has handled so many of these independent studios that they gobbled up, it might have almost been a blessing that we ended up not signing them because who knows if that game, that development studio might have just been the first one that management came in and crushed like a beer can. Who, uh, who knows? All I know is back at the time, we, we didn't sign it. And it, it, sometimes you got to let the creative people breathe. And, and it's not something that, uh, it's something that in a in a an intellectual property company like EA, you go back and forth on where 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 you, the feeling in the company grows that oh you're giving you're giving them too much freedom. So we need to give them the corporate vision, you know. And then the corporation says, Oh, well, we're building all these cookie cutter games, so we have to let them have their way a little bit more. It, it's just it's a constant tug of war. And uh, unfortunately, since I st stopped being a part of that, and since I left, they've gone much more the corporate side, overwhelming these, these poor developers, these very, very talented studios that have built great titles that are no longer making their own titles. They're, they're the talents spread to the winds and hopefully are still in the industry building great stuff for us to interact with. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them just started drinking and got out of the business all completely. Oh, jazz Jackrabbit. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That was the, yeah. Yeah. And the, the original uh, Epic pinball games. I mean, those are the games oh, really, that I really like where that. I contacted uh, where I contacted Mark Rain for the first time and, and uh, talked to him about, you know, doing another, uh, doing another pinball game. Cause 
pinball's a pinball then was a uh, consistent uh, seller. Simple, simple to do. Yeah. <laughs> around the you remember pinball dreams and pinball fantasies there's like this little yeah. pinball thing for a while that was i loved it i loved all of these games I... yeah i uh the only thing we couldn't get right on the we only, we couldn't get right on the playstation was the load times oh my god did it take a long time to load on the ps1 oh once it got in there, then of course it was it was there, but uh, oh, just we didn't know we didn't know what the hell we were doing on the PS One at that time. <laughs> you ever do any work on the three DO? Yeah, I worked on uh, I worked on the uh, a little bit on the Madden game for the three DO, and uh, yeah, worked on the Sega CD, worked on Walsh College Football for that. Uh, I. That's sort of I, I just, I, I didn't, I feel, I understand why Trip wanted to do what he did, but uh, I just, the three DO. I just felt, I, yeah, I, I just felt that uh, once, once I saw who was going to make it and how much it was going to cost, I, I knew that it was just a matter of time before it, it Died, it died a horrible death. <laughs> the 3 ds high price of oversaturated console market. Oh, come on. Yeah, and lack of reputation, la lack of ability to, to get third parties to, to build for it. Wait, was this $700? Yeah, oh yeah. That, is that adjusted for inflation or is that what it cost? No, no, that's what it cost back then. That's <laughs> what it cost. God, just whoa yeah no i mean i uh trip did yeah how much was the sega I, could have been couldn't have been half it must have been like half. sometimes you know un unfortunately uh, unfortunately just because you you had the vision to create electronic arts doesn't mean you, you all of your visions are perfect and just because, like I said with myself, that just because I had a good idea on one game doesn't mean that I have a good idea on all games. <laughs> I somehow I didn't realize it was quite that expensive. I mean, no wonder. Oh yeah. No, like it was. Uh, it was. Uh, it was horrifically, horrifically expensive, and that was back in the day. That that's like a thousand dollars today. I mean, I can't. I can't imagine any. I mean, it was. That'd be more expensive than than a high end laptop. It's double double the expense of a Steam Deck. In non adjusted cost, it's double the price of a Steam Deck. Now, now, do you want one? <laughs> I guess yeah. It's you're right. You got these. You sort of it probably was very powerful and for and its it, time. You just can't. Yeah, the yeah the the best thing, the reason EA succeeded, in my opinion, overall, Trip's original vision was was great. It drew talented people to the company to want to work with them as independent contractors and to want to work for the company proper. Secondly, was the gamble that we took on the Amiga that the company took on the Amiga because it got us all of this 68,000 processor experience in building tools for it and everything else. And that would pay off later because da, 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 the Sega Genesis was a 68,000 based video game machine. And here we'd already built games and software and tools for a 68,000 base machine and we built a clean room and we reverse engineered the Genesis or the talented people at EA reverse engineered the Genesis and we were able to publish our own cartridges. And that, that was the boom. That was the big, big kaboom in electronic arts was the fact that those things happened. 
I never made that connection before between the Amiga and the Stega <laughs> and the 68,000. That's, <laughs> yeah, you know, that makes, well, talk about serendipity, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we already had, we already had bit twiddlers in our, in our company that were used to working on a 68,000 base machine. So then they, you know, when that team went and reverse engineered it and Trip walked in with a finished cartridge of Populous and I can't remember what else, maybe it was Sukadin. Uh, when he walked in with finished cartridges to Sega to say, with or without you, we're publishing these. <laughs> and they, they, were, they came to an agreement but that was the that was the big kaboom for electronic arts being able to publish our own sega genesis cartridges which meant that we could build both small games and mega blockbusters we could build them cheaper and we had a better control on our inventory so we didn't end up with hundreds of thousands of units sitting in the warehouse not selling yeah, probably some of the best games for the Genesis, really. A lot of them. Yeah, and then the clean. Yeah, I mean, just I mean that like I, that's where Madden and NHL debuted, you know, and, and the, the the fact that that uh, that uh, the fir one of the first games on there was Populous, if you can believe that. Uh, I mean, it, it was. Uh, you can't imagine playing a God game on a Sega Genesis, but there it was, and it was playable, and it was fun. It was fun. That's a great game. Yeah, yeah, I remember uh, I remember when the first version on the Amiga came in, and uh, uh, Paul Grace, and I can't remember who else it was, but Paul Grace uh, found a long peer-to-peer uh, -peer network work cable and they had it strung over cubicles to reach Amiga to Amiga so that they could so that they could play multiplayer uh, Populous. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever even played a multiplayer. Oh, Bullfrog Productions, right. Yeah. Peter Molyneux. Peter Molyneux, yes. Molyneux. A visionary but a liar. Oh, Rob Hubbard. <laughs> Rob Hubbard did the music for that too. I didn't realize that. So Rob Hubbard did the populist theme. Oh yeah. Oh, so you're talking yeah, about we were... <laughs> Peter being a liar. Is this the fable? <laughs> yeah. The fable. And, and everything else. Yeah. No, I mean I've visionary, but uh, tr truth uh, truth deprived. <laughs> Is he still active in the industry? I haven't heard from him in a while. I haven't heard from him lately. I haven't heard anything from him lately. Last thing I heard from him was that big gobbledygook regarding that cube thing that people were chipping away at and that people would be able to come a god in his next game. And then that game never came out. And... Have you been keeping track of all this business with the NFTs that they're... Oh, I, I hate it. I hate it. I, I mean, the, the only thing that gets my blood, the only thing that gets my blood boiling more are uh, predatory microtransactions. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand it from a business standpoint. I understand it um, that it can be good creatively as well. But I, I just think that so many games now are just, especially from the bigger studios, are just so predatory. I mean, the, this latest Diablo game, I understand that you got to spend $100,000 in real world capital in order to have a fully buffed character in the game. It's just like, my God, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to touch that game. I don't, I don't, I, I, the fact that you would come out with something like that, I would much rather pay $60 for a game and then have my option to buy add-on content for, you know, if it's a skin, a buck or two, or if it's additional scenarios, another 15 or 20 bucks, I'd much rather have that than 
this whole, oh, you can pr- play for free. Yeah, there you go. This is crap. So this is like a hundred thousand something dollars. Yeah, there, there, there you go. I mean, you upgrade your character. Yeah, see, this is when you start getting into this kind of stuff. So I mean, I I saw this I saw this the other day, and I just went, I I'm not thing. even gonna play. I'm not even gonna play this thousand dollars. I'm not even gonna play this game. And that, that what a and 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 the worst part of that is is that I've heard from people that it's a pretty fun game. So here it is. I'm missing out on this really fun game because they won't charge me a regular amount of money for it. They they have to do this crud. Yeah, it and, and like NFTs on you know, this whole idea of the microtransactions and. I'm like, uh, I think I'm in agreement. I'd rather just pay up front and not have to deal with this sort of thing as I'm trying to. Play. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody looks back at uh, every and everybody should look back on uh, on the great giggle that we all had at the time that we didn't think would ever catch on of the horse armor in uh, in what was it? Was it Elder Scrolls that had the horse armor in it from uh, Bethesda? I, I, that was the first microtransaction that I can really remember the horse armor. It didn't do anything. Didn't make your horse more protected. It was purely, purely cosmetic and they were going to charge you money for it. And, and you know, now it's a meme and a, and a punch line. Yeah. But I, I think that that's, that's the very, that's the very first time that I can remember that, that, uh, that there was a, a microtransaction in, in a game and that now just uh, unbelievable. Yeah, like they only wanted two dollars and fifty dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> now we're talking a hundred, hundred and ten thousand dollars. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and the company that we were just talking about. I mean, Electronic Arts. I mean, look what happened to them with the Star Wars Battlefront Two. My God, I mean, the the loot boxes were such a thing that. Oh uh, yeah, I remember that. The, the game got outlawed in several countries, and, and and now there are all these countries that won't let a game with uh, a similar similar uh, mechanics in it, similar uh, game progression mechanics in it, uh, even be certified in their country um, because of it. So I, it's gonna, it, as long as they're, I yeah. Really, it, so what's this, this loot crates? They were afraid this was like gambling for kids. Yeah, and it is, it is. In order to names, in right? order to get the best character, the you know the legendary characters, you had to spend real money after you'd already bought the game in order to have a chance to get them. It doesn't. I'm trying to see how much money it was costing people. Surely it wasn't over hundred grand. No, no. This is just the latest egreg- egregious uh, thing. And, and NF teams, NFTs make no sense to me. And, and I think that to the gaming public, I, I think that what you're hearing from the gaming public in general is that they don't want them either, that they don't want NFTs. And, and if the marketplace continues to thumb their nose at, at, at NFTs, they will go away. But that doesn't mean that these publishers aren't going to try a few more times to try and get more money because... The almighty dollar is the almighty dollar, and that's why they're in business. And I under I understand that you're trying to maximize profits and, and uh, reduce your development expenses. I guess it, it was the, it was the ethical dilemma you always get into. With this that story. was the that was the the tool that was the the trick back in the day. It's the trick now, but uh, you know. And then you have these AAA studios like Rockstar, and they go and they say, well, they're going to spend $300 million building a, a game. And they go, oh, but that's Rockstar. And, and that's right. That is Rockstar, because the moment that they, that they release that $300 million game, they make a half billion dollars on day one. And it's only, and knowing the longevity and the more people that come into the ecosystems where they can continue to market and remarket that game, it ends up being 
billions and billions of dollars that they end up making from that. And uh, I, I remember back at Electronic Arts where we were trying to get to the point where the company, the entire company made a billion dollars in one year. That was, and it, it happened the year, the year that I left Electronic Arts was the year, the first billion dollar year of Electronic Arts. And I saw Larry Probst at E3 the next year and I went up and shook his hand and I just congratulated him. I said, congratulations, you, you did it. You got it over a billion dollars for the, for the company. You know, I, that was uh, an amazing accomplishment back in the day built on the skeletons of all of the people that actually built the, the company. <laughs> Larry Probst. Yep. A million dollars is still a quite a big sum, at least to me. <laughs> Chairman of the USOC. Yep. I. Sounds like there's little love lost there, huh? He, he was the head of, he was the head of the distribution arm of electronic arts that was his original position at EA and um, EA, EAD was like I told you earlier in our discussion was one of the biggest reasons why electronic arts was successful back in the day because they could keep they could keep their uh, um, we could keep our handle on what was going out there on the marketplace better because our sales our direct sales force was tied into the, the everything from the big chains to the mom and pop stores which existed back then you know now it's fire and forget you only have the big marketplaces and of course you have the digital marketplace and that's that's it so now the end user, the end user and the review bombs are what you have to worry about these days. Yeah, I guess it's just thinking back to when we first started the our chat and you going into the game store and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it's so different. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean all these stores. I mean when I, 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 I folks. When I said electronics boutique and Babbage's earlier, what I should have said was GameStop. It's probably the only contemporary um, uh, reference point that you have for what those those stores were like, because uh, th those were the the uh, biggish uh, game retailers then. Games games only. Yeah, GameStop. What an interesting story that's become with yeah <laughs> we've been tracking how that sort of become this meme phenomenon yeah. all these all this crazy stuff a couple of great great documentaries out there 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 i i watched uh i watched on uh hulu a couple of weeks ago there's a really great documentary about the whole uh gamestop uh thing what happened the the big uh, uh, squeeze the short squeeze that happened, and it's all about the original like ten or eleven players that that inadvertently made that happen before everybody else piled on, and it got into be this big huge issue. These were the people that saw that the stock was undervalued and said i'm going to play long term with this and at the at the end of the at the end of the documentary i think it said that the the uh, original 11 people that uh, caught on to this they ended up profiting uh, 33 and a half million dollars total uh, on their investments in gamestop and of course they're really tiny tiny investors so i mean i can imagine that that their few thousand dollars ended up being a few hundred thousand dollars at the end of the at the end of what happened for them and and all because again they had passion and they had instincts and they they followed all of that 
down this gaming rabbit hole and they, they didn't say, oh, I'm going to make a profit. They didn't say, I'm going to make a profit off of the stock. These guys looked at the company and they said, this company and what it does is undervalued for, for what this stock price is. That, that was, and you hear that in the documentary. They're not going, oh, I'm going to turn this around quick. I, you know, they, they weren't house flippers where they're saying, oh, I'm going to invest $2 and make three fifty dollars on it tomorrow. They're, they were saying, oh, no, this company is undervalued and I'm going to invest in it. And, and uh, the, I need to watch this. What's the, do you know the name of this uh, documentary? I, I think it, it's called uh, GameStop for the Players. Oh, I gotta watch it, that. It was on who? It was on Hulu. GameStop for the players. I yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we've done some overtime. <laughs> <laughs> I had fun. I had I had a wonderful time. It's great to talk about all this stuff. Uh, I don't get a chance to do that anymore. And uh, with the way I've been feeling and everything, uh, I, I've. I built up all my energy so that I could talk to you today, and I have no idea how much more time I have uh, here, but uh, it was a pleasure to get it all out of my system, and uh, no matter how much, uh, how many more months I have, uh, at least I got it all out of my system, and, and there will be some um recording of uh my thoughts uh and on that time and i got to shout out a lot to a lot of people that uh, that i respected so so much that that made all of what i got was lucky enough to experience that made it all possible i didn't i don't have the career I don't, I don't have those times uh, building those games without those people, plain and, plain and simple. They made it possible, and I, I, I like I've said again, I, I forced Gump my way through, through that, that era. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, should be back very soon. Got some uh, great interviews lining up. Again, Sue's coming to the support of the show. She knows a lot of people. Help me uh, make contacts. A lot of you guys on the Discord channels, on the Twitter, Facebook, right here on YouTube. You know, if there's somebody you want to see on the show uh, and you know how to get in touch with them or you reach out to them, that can really make a big difference. It's a lot more likely that they'll come on the show if somebody else <laughs> this just my experience you know if somebody else is telling them hey you should come on this uh, matt chat show and uh, meet this matt barton guy they tend to respond to that a lot more than they do if it's just coming from me because uh, a lot of times they don't know you know what what this show is about uh, so anyway uh, thank you to everyone who's been helping me to reach out to people uh, and if there's somebody you would like to uh, have on the show you know uh, do a little leg, leg work and we can make that happen so Definitely thank you, uh, again, to Sue, uh, as well, of course, uh, to Happy and everybody else who has contributed to the show. Uh, I want to, as always, thank you very, 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 very much for supporting this show, for making Matt Chat happen. Folks, uh, we wouldn't be doing this without you. There would be no Matt Chat. Uh, this, this show would have ended a long time ago. Uh, but it was people like you that stepped forward and said, look, uh, you know, I kind of like what you're doing here, Matt. <laughs> Keep the shows coming. Look, is there some way I can help? You know, I like to uh, do my part. You know, a lot of people have stepped forward and supported the show on Patreon. Uh, they supported the show by retweeting things, uh, by, again, helping me get in touch with people. Uh, sometimes just leaving a comment, a thumbs up, you know, subscriptions, you know, whatever you do uh, that you're comfortable doing uh, to support the show. Look, it's needed, and I deeply truly and gratefully <laughs> i gratefully am grateful to all of the support really means a lot to me guys so just thanks again never forget how appreciative i am for your part in helping make this show happen so again thank you if you for whatever reason have been hesitating like oh <laughs> you know uh look it's fine uh, don't worry about it just go to the link in the show notes there's a patreon page there couple of minutes, a few clicks, 
bada boom, bada bing, you know, a buck a show, that's all I'm asking. And that'll get you access to that really awesome Discord channel. It's a very exclusive uh, <laughs> community. <laughs> you know, I, I gotta say, I think I got the best Discord channel. I don't, maybe I'm a little biased, but I mean, there's just some great people on there. You know, it's just so much fun uh, reading all the stuff and posting to it. Even have little rat emoticons we can use to reply to each other. So, you know, if you might, a lot of people uh, support me on Patreon, but they haven't really checked out that Discord channel. And just go ahead and check it out. I think you'll be impressed. I think you'll like it. Uh, but anyway, enough on that. What about that news from the Met Cave? Oh, yeah. You know, Matt Workula, you know, I, I, was, I was trying to see, can I like, just do this without the little uh, you know, news from the Matt Cave titles and stuff? And, you know, Matt was like, where the hell are the titles? Where's that little, uh, <laughs> you know, that little thing you do but to uh, introduce the new segment? Hey, I didn't even think anybody would notice, but it just goes to show you how wrong you can be. You know, Matt's like, look, you better get that thing back up there, man. Uh, I think I made him cry. You know, and I apologize to you, Matt, for that. I did put it back in. <laughs> I'll keep it in from now on. <laughs> uh, don't worry, Matt. It's okay. It's back. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, just for you, I put it back in. All right. On to the news, then. First up, a little piece there, a uh, little news item, I suppose, from uh, a Lobsterminator. Maybe one of the best handles I've ever heard. Lobsterminator. <laughs> Maybe the guy likes lobsters. I don't know. I, I like lobsters, can't really afford to eat lobster too much, but when I do, I like to eat them. Let's see, what does he have to say? I got so distracted by the lobsters. <laughs> okay. Now he's writing in about a Fallout-style RPG teased by a company named New Blood. So they are slowly trickling out some details about this thing, some screenshots. It's called a retro-futurist isometric CRPG. Retro-futurist isometric CRPG. So that is, that's kind of how I would describe the original Fallout series. Seems like that was the, uh, the sort of aesthetic they were going for. Let's see, Laco is the mastermind of Project Van Buren. Oh, this is about the people that, that are making this. They're veterans. You know, they've had some involvement in the Fallout or the Fallout modding scenes over the years. Uh, this guy Laco was part of this Project Van Buren, an effort to resurrect Black Isle Studios' original Fallout 3, which was canceled in 2003. <laughs> Man, how tragic was that? Uh, Barazin, known as uh, Red 888Guns, Red 888Guns, uh, on DeviantArt, an artist who has previously worked on Fallout Sonora and Olympus 2207 mods. So some pretty good people working on this. We're all excited about it, wishing them luck. Again, not a whole lot of details yet, but definitely something to keep an eye on. So thank you, Lops Terminator. And then uh, Steve Machine Dalton, the shredder extraordinaire. You should hear this guy play guitar. You know, one of the things you might be able to do here. I've been trying to get him to post more videos on the Discord channel. He's really, uh, really phenomenal. Uh, really good guitar. Uh, yeah, just shredder, I think. The right, <laughs> is that the correct term? <laughs> Somebody who's good on guitar. Uh, he's got right wrote about Dragon's Dogma 2. A uh, new announcement. Now, this is a series, I don't know anything about Dragon's Dogma. It's just kind of right over the radar for me. Haven't played it. Everybody's saying, what the hell, Matt? You know, play the first one. It's, it's really great stuff. Um, you know, maybe that'll be the next match yet. We'll see. Uh, but anyway, the second game, uh, they, they released a commentary video with information about inspirations for the game, key gameplay elements. That will, of course, be using uh, Capcom's RE Engine. I'm not really sure what RE stands for, but anyway, everybody on Discord is excited about this. <laughs> so, so it's probably time I should check out Dragon's Dogma and see what all the fuss is about. And then Miko, good old Miko. Oh, this is good. I like this. So get your copy of the Daggerfall Unity Gog Cut. Now, you know I'm a big fan of Daggerfall. I have the shirt. <laughs> Uh, well, they, somebody has gone in and they've redone the thing with Unity, which is a great game engine. Brings it up to modern times, basically. Uh, play a reimagined version of the all-time RPG classic from the Elder Scrolls series. Dragonfall Unity GOG Cut brings this amazing experience to modern gamers. It has been made possible thanks to the efforts of the gamer Zach, a gaming content creator with a love for classics. 
Gamer Zach. Gamer Zach. Gamer Zach. <laughs> you know, you sound like somebody I should have on the show. Hey, Gamer Zach. Um, that's Z A K H. Get on the show, man. <laughs> yeah, we could talk about Daggerfall Unity God Cut. Sure. Sounds pretty awesome. Love to talk, chat with him. Or her, I suppose. Do we know? Don't know too much about Gamer Zach. Definitely need to have this person on the show. Mate Miko. <laughs> All right. What about that ale of the week? Uh, yes. Been a while. You know, a lot of folks been requesting these things, but, you know, uh, kind of limited these days. You know, if, if you want to, uh, if you got some something special you want to see me review on the show, uh, you can go ahead and just send that to me. It's probably the easiest way. I recommend sending two, just in case something goes goes wrong. Uh, but this one is, is really special. It's a, it's a home brew from the guy doing the State Fair, Minnesota State Fair homebrew competition. He gave me this kind of a free uh, gift, I guess, to sample it. He gave me some details on this. Patrick Kermy, 2022 or 2022 Minnesota State Fair homebrew competition. Now it's not a beer. It's uh, yeah, what do they call these? I probably should know this. Uh, mead, I think. M E <laughs> meads. You know, I've had like one mead before. I don't think I've ever had one outside of the Renaissance Festival. Uh, so I don't really know what I'm going to get myself into here. Apparently he's pretty good. You know, he's running this uh, fair homebrew competition, so hopefully this will be nice. He calls it a Princess Tree Blossom Honey from Hawaii. Semi-sweet and petulant. You know, I thought he had misspelled petulant, but no. Petulant. <laughs> petulant <laughs> means uh, naturally sparkling. Again, no idea really what I'm getting myself into, but he was nice enough to give it to me, so I'm definitely going to sample it here for you today. Anyway, let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. All right, had to find my trusty Predator bottle opener. Pretty sure this is not a twist off. It could be. Let's see, Princess Tree. Get her open. Ugh. I don't have a glass, unfortunately. So what can I pour this into? Oh, look at this. I have a drinking horn. <laughs> <laughs> you always, <laughs> you know, I give everything the sniff test, folks. Can't really smell anything coming out of the bottle, though. So let's go ahead and get this in the horn. Uh, my custom-made drinking horn from Steinar the Viking. He's the real deal. He's a true Viking. He's a pretty fantastic guy, too. He makes these uh, horns. He can customize these for you, put whatever you want to on it. Ah, you know, God, what does that smell like? It's a uh, very floral, kind of a, I guess it does kind of smell like peaches. Yeah, I guess that's what it smells like, kind of like a peach juice. Maybe a little bit of apricot in there. There's no, uh, you know, I don't know what kind of alcohol content we're talking here. Hopefully low. <laughs> I don't smell any alcohol in it. I think there might be a little bit left in the, or, or some that's produced. Yeah, I really need to learn more about mead. I, I just don't know anything about it. <laughs> I know it's made with honey. <laughs> that's about the extent of my knowledge. Uh, plus, it's kind of a medieval beverage. So that's always exciting. Anyway, it smells nice. So let's give it a taste here. Woo! Oh, yeah. <laughs> got a bit of a kick to it. Ooh, kind of sour. Uh, a little bit bitter, kind of a little bit of like a, like a, like an orange rind, uh, like flavor to that. Uh, very sweet. Actually quite kind of like a, a little bit like apple juice, maybe. Just all sorts of uh, flavors going on here. Let me try that again. You know, it kind of tastes like a, like wine. Yeah, I would say like a wine, a little kind of like a sweet wine with a kind of a, a sourness to it. It's actually, actually quite pleasant. I'll try one more time. <laughs> you know, it's a good sign when I go for the third third try. Hmm. Yeah, that is uh, uh, quite nice. Uh, tastes good. A little bit, you know, I don't, <laughs> you're definitely not going to mistake this for an ale. Uh, it's really kind of outside my zone of expertise. I don't really even know how to rate this thing. 
you know how to compare it to other meads uh, i'll just say it's good <laughs> I'm try, try one more time there's probably some of you guys laughing at me like man i can't believe you haven't tried more mead man what what the hell look you can't do everything <laughs> uh, anyway that is good uh, again i have no standard of comparison not having other meads i don't think it's fair to try to compare it to ales it's kind of an apples and oranges type thing uh, but yeah I'll go, I'll go five out of five on this sure uh, give me some more meads and maybe then i can say well it was better than this or worse than that or whatever but very pleasant beverage you know, I can see why this guy is, uh, you know, running the State Fair homebrew competition. Uh, so anyway, thank you again. I don't know if Patrick will ever see this. <laughs> Maybe I'll send him a link so he can at least watch this part. Uh, but thank you uh, for that very uh, interesting experience and something fun to do for the L segment. Okay, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And, uh, you know, uh, since Happy worked on a lot of these sports games, I was looking for quotes by coaches and I've uh, done some Madden quotes already, so I was looking for some by Bill Walsh. And man, this guy has some epic quotes. I mean, a real wordsmith. Uh, it's, it was very hard to choose just one. You know, I could have done like two or three that I, I really like. But anyway, I, th I think this one is probably one of my favorites. It goes something like this. People thrive on positive reinforcement. They can take only a certain amount of criticism, and you may lose them all together if you criticize them in a personal way. You can make a point without being personal. Don't insult or belittle your people. Instead of getting more out of them, you will get less. Very powerful words there from somebody who knows a few things about leadership. Mr. or Coach Bill Walsh. Well, I think that'll do it for this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that and see you next time.